Hey, hey, what's up, my friend? So today we have Brian Lee, a professional gamer who became a day trader. Brian is known right for taking $5,000 and then growing it to seven figures and beyond. So if you want to connect with Brian, right, I'll put his link to his social media profile in the description below. For now, here's what we've covered in today's conversation. Number one, life of a professional gamer. We talk about the mindset, the process, and what it takes to play with the big boys. And throughout the conversation, I realized that there's actually a lot of parallels between professional gaming and being a professional trader. Number two, why Brian chose right to leave the gaming career behind and to focus on becoming a day trader. Number three, how Brian finds his age in the markets. Number four, this is a uh, something that you guys are pretty excited about, Brian Lee's own day trading strategy. We talk about his trading setup, the entry, the stop loss, the targets, the trade management, and how he manages the trade from start to finish. And finally, number five, right, how he took $5,000 and grew it into millions of dollars. So all this and more in today's conversation. Sounds good, then go listen to it right now. All right, Brian, welcome. Welcome to the show. Happy to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. And by the way, uh, I, I've listened to a few of your podcasts and I feel that, you know, if you are not in trading, right, you could jolly well just, you know, be a DJ. I, I hear that voice, man, that's really a soothing voice you've got. So something to consider, right? If, you know, <laughs> you want to stop trading someday, you know, DJ, you know, might be an option. <laughs> yeah, I thought about um, like doing audiobooks or something like that. Yeah, maybe I, I would say you have a, a gift for that, right? <laughs> so yeah, to kick things off, right, I'm just uh, curious, right? In, in one sentence, right? How would you describe your, your childhood? My childhood? Okay. Uh, very competitive. Like I had, a, I had a cousin that was about a year apart and he was kind of like my brother from another mother. I didn't, I had a younger brother now, but he's 10 years younger. I grew up with a younger sister and so... Um, Sorry, I think I killed this one, but like, very competitive. Just we would always play video games, Smash Bros, Halo, try to get the best of each other. Okay, so so you have. A, I, mean, I understand. You know, you're from. You play esports, and we will get to that later. But just kind of like want to understand you know, what kind of person you were like back in school. So you're like kind of like competitive gaming. So what's maybe the first game you you played? Right, I guess that should be, you know, something you remember. I think it had, had to be one of those, uh, like Mega Man or something on Super Nintendo. Mega Man, oh, Super Nintendo. All right. Yeah, that's kind yeah. of my time. So I played, uh, yeah, Super Nintendo. That was my first on cartridges back then. I mean, it cost like 70, 80 bucks. My, my dad used to spend money on that. Yeah. So <laughs> in school then, right, what kind of kid were you like in school? Were you the, I don't know, the studious type, right? The, 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 the one getting to trouble or what? I think, I think people thought I was smart, uh, but. I always thought it was just because I put in a lot more effort. Like I felt stupid. So I just put in a little bit more effort than other people. And so people thought I was smart. <laughs> That's how it was. So so you get like pretty good grades consistently, true? Uh, I almost I almost flunked out of uh, high school and I didn't graduate from university. I dropped out of university as well. But when I was applying myself, I was a straight eight student. I just wanted to do other things. Like I don't, I didn't really see the value in school very much. Why do you say that? I just feel like you can't really apply a lot of it. You know, th there's no direction. I feel like if they taught us things like taxes and like stock market and how to uh, basically transition into adulthood, like practical skills, you know, I felt like everything was just leaning towards like, you're either going to be going into like a science major or doing something more like engineering. But um, like literally when I went to college, I was like, I'm just going to do creative writing because I like writing. And I realized how useless it was. So I was like, there's no way that I'm going to go through school and come out of this like with a career. <laughs> so when you decide to uh, drop out of school, right, despite people thinking that, hey, this Brian is actually pretty smart. Right? So what was like your, your, your parents' uh, take on it? Um, my parents are pretty relaxed. My, my dad's really smart. He went to um, one of the top universities and he is a doctor. Um, and my mom is comes from cambodia she's very uh, impoverished background she's actually a refugee from the uh genocide and right um, okay oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt you i i i was uh please continue and I'll, I'll just take it from there later on yeah okay uh so basically she just really pushed me very hard to 
you know, do the traditional thing, just be a doctor or whatever. But um, my dad never really put pressure on me. So I got away with a lot. Like I pretty much ditched like half of high school and just played video games all the time. Right. Maybe just to, to dig a little bit further back in time about your parents, because you mentioned the genocide. And I was in Phnom Penh, I think, a couple of years back, and I went to the uh, yeah. the, 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 the killing ground. So I think, it, was it 1960s or 1970s? There's this particular, I won't call it organization, but, you know, people in control, right? And they killed, like, a quarter of the population. I mean, the numbers could be higher, probably higher, right? Yeah. But I think where I read was, like, a quarter of the population, right? Because of that event. So was it, like, during that event, that's where your mom decided to you know, move away to to uh, to the states. Yeah, my uh, my grand my grandfather was a uh, considered education uh, educated person because he was a professor, and anyone who was educated was going to be killed. So my entire family was basically on the chopping block, and uh, luckily, one of the um, Army officials actually had a crush on one of my aunties and helped them escape. And they basically had to cross over to Vietnam through like snakes and landmines. And she did lose some siblings um, on that journey. And um, they got sponsored by a like a Christian family here in the States. And eventually, one by one, just started flying over here. Gosh, that's, that's a crazy story, man. That's wow. I mean, I can't believe what your family went through, right? Because I, I was actually at the killing grounds and they were showing us, you know, kind of like a whole level of all the, the bones, right? The skulls that were being penetrated it's by crazy. Know, what objects they use. Yeah, it's crazy. So so I'm glad all is well, all is safe for you and, you know, your future generation as well. I think in the States is a lot more safer. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, thank you for sharing. Right? I think that is something, a history I think not many people know. If I myself, I did not know it until I went to, to Phnom Penh for a holiday and realized I didn't know that, man, they have such history which is actually quite recent, like just you know, 20, 30 years. Very okay, recent. A bit, a bit further back, yeah. So yeah, so okay, so we, we I hear a lot about, you know, gaming and no surprise, right, on other podcasts, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, esports, competitive gaming. So so let's talk about how did that happen? How do you transition from just a casual gamer to, you know, God, let's do this, right? Let's go to the international, you know, and, and you know, go big, right? <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> um, I, I used to be a pretty popular kid in school like i didn't play many games and uh mostly hang out with people but one of my neighbors who lived down the street was really into starcraft and so naturally we just started hanging out and i was like what is this game and i started like it was with dial-up internet and i was like you can play versus other people this is amazing because before you're just playing games by yourself and you're like okay well once you start seeing like all these different people online and like all these different personalities and stuff like that it's just like it's so engaging and then other people started playing it and eventually at some point I was just so competitive I was like I just got way better than them and I was like I need to find new friends otherwise you know these games are just too easy and at that point I just started looking for like competitive teams and stuff like that and just doing it as a hobby but I just really loved it because you know like as a young person uh, especially as an Asian kid like not very athletic and things like that so being able to like do something really competitive um was super fun, especially on a team environment. So I was like always go- trying to compete in tournaments and stuff like that with my friends. So you start off with StarCraft and if I recall, you end up playing competitive uh, Dota 2, right? If, if I'm not wrong? Mm-hmm. Because my, uh, one of my older cousins recognized I was playing a lot of like a lot of StarCraft and he uh, showed me this documentary. I think of, I think it was of Moon. He's a very, I don't, yeah, it was Moon was a Warcraft 3 player. And he's very, very famous because he's really unconventional. But he was basically one of the greatest of all time Korean players. And he, they were doing a documentary about showing how he um, like made a living playing video games, which was like not a thing. And then my cousin's like, look, you, you can make money playing games and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So then at the back of my mind, I was just thought about like, well, why can't I do that too? So you mentioned that you're getting a, way too good for your peers and you had to find new so-called teammates or people to play around with. So how, how do you find it? Was it based online or you were you in the land shop, you know, kind of like, you know, socializing with other players? It's just online. You know, you, just, you naturally just make friends because you, like, if you're good, you know, people just want to talk with you and like add you. 
That's reality, right? You got money, people just come to you. Hey, you know, let's be friends. Right? Same, same for gaming. Okay. I mean, so, it's, so, it's, yeah. Sorry, it's not. It's not unlike trading, where you know, if you um, well, trading is a little bit more difficult to tell like who's real and stuff like that. But uh, you just shoot your shot. You know, if you kind of like put yourself out there a little bit and show like, hey, I have this kind of skill, or like I'm trying to improve. You know, even if you don't have the actual skill, if you show effort. People kind of want to connect to that because if they have the same kind of ambition, you just kind of attract each other. And so, um, you know, it's not it's not very unlike trading as well. You just attract people that you're looking for and uh, try not to be so isolated and just kind of try to do it on your own. Hmm. So when you got into a professional gaming, right? You no. Know, what makes you think that, you know, you can do this as a, as a career. Like you mentioned you just watched a documentary and then, you know, what gives you the I don't know, conviction, the confidence to know, that, hey, you know, I can do this too. <laughs> um, to be honest, I just, I, I did it as a, as a passion and um, it was more fun than anything. I just consistently felt like I was getting better and better and at some point, you know, it just kind of felt like a little bit too easy. So, I wanted to see if I could do this like in a tournament style, like how far I would go through a tournament. And we just played this tournaments for like pizza every month. It was held on a forum and like every week my goal was just to get to the next round. So like if you're in round 32, get to the 16, get to the quarterfinal, etc. And eventually we won it. And when we when we won it, I started recognizing like like I like we literally just beat everybody in North America like right now, like the best players. So when you conquer your region you naturally you want to think about like international stage as well so on the forum where you guys came in first i suppose it's a pretty big forum right to actually be top of the forum and then conquer the whole of north america yeah it was like it's a it's a small niche like you know if if um i know you're not like necessarily part of the small caps community but kind of everybody knows everybody you know, anyone who's like very serious or just kind of out there, you you're only like a couple of degrees apart. Like you're usually just one person away from the next person. So it's kind of like the same thing was in gaming. It's a small community. Everybody knows each other. There's just the one place we met because uh, we there was no like Twitter or stuff like that. So we just use forums and uh, chat rooms stuff like that. And from my understanding, Dota is it's five players. So where do you find the remaining four players right, to to form that team? Well, I actually um, made a post like saying that hey, I, like I really want to compete, and I'm looking for these kind of teammates. So you you just list out like the roles you want, and I was like, okay, I play. Uh, I'm I'm gonna be the leader. I play this support role, and I'm looking for like a carry. Uh, I'm looking for other support players and stuff like that. And then eventually, you just kind of try people out and see if you mesh and if you have the same goals, and then eventually. You know, that's you just kind of commit to it. I, I made everyone uh, at different points in my career. There were different teams, but like the main team that really like pushed me into the international stage. Uh, it was a team that like we did this process, and then I made them sign a contract that they were just gonna like go hard for a whole year, <laughs> and then we pretty much did it like more than full time, like all of us. So it's like a interview process where you're interviewing the right candidates, going for a trial, and deciding, hmm, is this a good fit or not. If it's a good fit, you yeah, can sign exactly. a contract and you know, let's go all in. Yeah, it was not as official as these days. These days, there are so many incentives. Like you have, I mean, if you have a sponsor, you can be like, "Hey, we'll pay you a salary and stuff like that." You want to join us? We're very reputable, whatever. Back then, you had to convince people to play for free every single day for sixteen hours. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a different skill back then. That's really passion at its highest level like playing for free and I and I'm curious do you have to like when you say play for free I'm guessing that they have to be at home playing right not say at a land shop paying like you know yeah. one dollar or two dollars an hour and stuff like that or playing from home remotely 16 hours a day yes and everyone's scattered all over the United States and Canada and so we have time zone uh. issues and uh, we also competed on the European servers because they were just way better than Americans so we were up like four or five o'clock in the morning and, uh, you know, motivating young people to wake up earlier than they wake up for school is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> the incentive 
has to be right. <laughs> Clearly, yeah. you guys have the, you know, the incentive at the top of your head, right? You know, let's do this. Okay. So, so when do you first, you know, meet your teammates, right? Like in, in, in real person? Oh, yeah. So we, uh, the first time we met was when we qualified for the, uh, the international. That's the biggest tournament. And uh, we all got picked up, like, by Valve. And they kind of, like, had someone pick you up in a limo or whatever at the airport. And we went to our um, – we stayed at our manager's house. We slept on his floor. He had, like, a one-bedroom apartment. <laughs> we had, like, six guys sleeping on the floor. And uh, <laughs> we just uh, – we, we contacted, like, a local land shop and – said hey we'll like give you some exposure if you let us practice here for like two weeks three weeks and so we got to know each other there but i felt like on the internet i feel like you you get to know people pretty well like i don't feel like there was any um, shock about like who they were or, like anything like that we spent so much time together so you know being in person doesn't really make a big difference to be honest so they were actually quite close to how they were like online yeah in, you can't you can't physical. really fake that I okay. mean, when when you spend so much time together, you can't fake it. Unless right. unless you're crazy, I don't know. Some people. Do <laughs> <laughs> so so I think uh, I read on. I mean, I heard on podcast that your goal was just to join the international. So I don't. Uh, for me, back in Singapore, I would think the biggest competition is called World Cyber Gaming, so WCG. Is is that like a different thing altogether at your end? That is. That's uh. I think that 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 organization is basically trying to be Olympics, which is which is pretty fun. Like I've I've competed in that tournament before, mm. trying to represent USA. Uh, but usually that's pretty fragmented because like like I said, a lot of these teams were kind of like spread all over. Some Canada. So when I competed, like we had to form like a USA team, and then my Canadian teammates had to form Team Canada. Um, but all I knew is they had a lot of money, which is why everyone wanted to play. They had a lot I of see. money. Yeah. I see. So the international is kind of like. Uh, even more bigger competition to really assess the the skills of people all around the world. The the international is like the pinnacle of esports. I mean, like even amongst all the the games today, I don't think any single esport has the prize pool of the international. Uh, it's the top sixteens in the entire world, um, and so yeah, I, I think it holds the most prestige, like in the entire esports scene, almost. I see. Yeah. So, I understand that right, your goal was to just to join the international, if I'm not wrong, to just take part in it, right? I think that was like the goal. It's not even to win, right? If I, if I hear correctly from the other podcast that you were on. So, I'm curious, what if your goal, right, was instead of just to take part, but it's actually, let's say, to win or even to be the top three. Do you think, do you think that uh, things would be different? Uh, I, I did want to win. I mean, everyone wants to win. I did. My goal was to get there. <laughs> But um, kind of similar to trading, it's like you know the best. Uh, the most you can do is basically perform your best, right? So the result is just it's a factor of like luck and timing and stuff like that. Uh, at the time, I felt like I was probably top two in the world at my role, and so I did have a confidence in myself. However, like when I formed that team, we were basically all amateurs. Like I, ne- I didn't pull any former professional uh, professional players or uh high tier players so like our skill ceiling was actually reduced pretty heavily compared to the international scene the main advantage that we had was that our um discipline was very high just from like drilling and practice and our strategies were really refined so in a lot of cases um we basically won on strategy alone or just teamwork but when it came down to the individual skill, I knew that we didn't necessarily have what it took to win compared to the rest of the field. So my ambition was basically to see how good I could do uh, with all those in mind. But you know, as an individual, I felt like I, I was good enough. So earlier you mentioned that you thought that you were like the top two in the world for the role that you're playing. So how do you define where your positioning is like because it's a 5v5 game how do you like kind of assess your skill on an individual level so every every player on the team is assigned a specific role um one through five so like 
one is the most important the most important person they're the one who gets all of the resources and they're the ones who are supposed to kind of carry the game to the end um they're like the damage dealers and then like my role was number five so in ranks of priority i was number or no i was actually number four sorry number four is like the second support character and essentially like they're the ones who make the shot calls they uh, initiate fights and they um are usually the first to go in so on my end like i'm comparing myself to other players in that position position four and so uh, it's pretty easy to tell like who's playing what because um at the time i had, like the i had a very diverse uh pool of like characters i could play strategies and i felt like my skill level was very high so i kind of i kind of knew at that time like i was very confident at a competitive level, you mentioned that there's individual skills and then there's like like strategy. So from what I'm hearing, I mean, in the ideal scenario, the each player in the team is very high skill and as a whole, their strategy is pretty top-notch as well. But let's say a theme like yours, right, where the skill is not so high, but the strategy is, is pretty top-notch. It can actually get you to pretty far places. Am I right to say that? Yeah, it's actually, you know, I lost faith in that after a while. But when I look back, I I do think the strategy and teamwork uh, discipline was like the most important thing, because like what a lot of really good players do uh, is they just kind of go in without a plan and they just rely on their skills and their instincts, and that works because a lot of times they can just outplay people. But like when you play against a team that knows what they're doing, they know how you're going to counter them, they know how to react. Uh, it's just on a completely different level. So. As I relate that to trading, it's kind of like I always g- try to go into trades now with like a strategy that I'm going to follow um, that I already pre-planned versus just kind of trying to react, react, react. And um, I think that's one thing that we did really well because when we had good strategies, we actually had like a like a 98% win rate over like 50 games. And um, that's when, that's with people who know what you're doing and they're trying to counter you all the time. And the thing is, we just know we just knew how to play what we did so well that when they try to counter us, like they're playing our game, we're playing our game. So um, we had the advantage. You know, it's like completely different when somebody comes in with their strategy and you feel like you you're on the back foot because they just know how to do it better than you. But when you make it so that other people are constantly reacting to you, what you're doing, um, you can take control of so many different variables. So I think it's a really important concept to just have a strategy. That's really well thought out. And am I right to say that <clears throat> just like trading there in, in gaming, there's no like best trading, I mean, best gaming strategy because every strategy can be countered by, by something else. And it's up to the team to kind of like react or adapt accordingly when someone uses a strategy that is supposed to come to you. Yeah, I think so. I think, in, I think the uh, feeling that you need to win everything is just kind of ridiculous. But that's the feeling that most people have. Like, People expect always to win. Uh, when you figure it out, they feel like, oh, I'm just going to crush the competition 100%. But um, in reality, like the teams that will win championships are the ones that just, you just win the best of threes over and over again. You win the best of three, you win the best of five. You don't have to win all three games. You just need to win two games at a best of three. So effectively, you have like a 66% win rate. Um, and really, it's just about being consistent. Like if you, if you try your best, your strategy didn't pan out, Next next game, run another strategy, and if you perform well, you know hopefully you take the take the game and then eventually the series. But like you know, back then I I really felt like the goal was to win hundred percent. But now I feel like you just have to win more than you lose. <laughs> That's all you have to do. So so you and your team, you guys like put in like sixteen hours a day. So I'm curious to know what does putting in the reps right look like for gaming? Because take for example, uh, like weightlifting, right? You know, if you're going for competition, right, you go to the other race like four sets or five sets, you know. 10 to 20 reps twice a day and, and just, you know, clock in the, the, the volume, right? When lifting weights, mm-hmm. right? Same for swimming. They probably pick up 6 a.m., you know, 20, 30 laps in the morning, maybe weight training and blah, blah, blah. So what what is it like for gaming when you say, you know, you guys are putting in the reps? Okay, so we wake up wake up at 5 a.m. on the West Coast. Uh, I, perp- I purposely uh, just roll into the game. Like, I just roll out of bed, go straight to my computer. We have uh, scrim partners already scheduled. And so we're usually playing at least two or three games with another partner. Uh, each game lasts about an hour. Uh, after that set, 
we'll either do a review or we would have had another scrim partner scheduled for another two or three games right after that so that's about like basically six hours of gaming nonstop. um if i was feeling very feisty i would do the reset so we'd go up to nine games nine hours afterwards it was my responsibility to review so we'd go over the replays uh figure out what we did right and wrong after we're you know basically done with it like not having any emotions about the game and we can kind of look back at it so usually that takes you know another two hours and we have a team discussion uh after the team's done i'm basically thinking of strategies and uh figuring out if i can implement them and i'll sometimes i'll test them in the game to see if it will work after all that basically we'll play like public games individually and each person basically should just be practicing their own um, their role and like what they want to do and getting more insights to how they can improve the team so that's how it pretty much goes and then in your off time you're just thinking about all the time so wow from what i'm hearing it's like gaming is your, is your life right from the moment you wake up to the time you sleep yeah but it's fun so like it's it's really fun <laughs> is there not, any not aspect hard. to it that you 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 didn't enjoy oh yeah i, I hate how immature people are so young it's a young person's game uh, a lot of the newer talents are like 17 18 years old or 20 or 20 years old and um even if they're let's say 22 or 23 they are typically four years behind mentally so when it comes to <laughs> conflict and uh <laughs> you know if, if you are literally just trying to say the truth uh the emotions will flare up people get defensive or they'll walk away from situations and it's very important that you basically have like this huge trust between each other. So like at the end of the day, I just really disliked how individual people were about their emotions and not really thinking about the team or having any empathy for basically leadership role, which is like, I'm not any different than you guys. Like I'm just one person, but like so much responsibility is on the leader to make sure there's harmony, trust, and that, uh, you know, like, if somebody's upset, you have to go and talk to them. Everyone else can go watch anime or something. And uh it's just a lot of it's just a lot of work for things that I feel like could be very simple. <laughs> like just let's work it out, let's talk about what we can do better. We all want the same thing. I'm not trying to be malicious, right? And or they might not be malicious either, but um Im- improving and having like a growth mindset and just thinking about how to win is the most important thing and uh, not everybody was equipped for that mentally i can imagine how much work right the leader needs to put in because not only you mentioned doing the review they got to strategize like for a team you know what new strategies should we implement you got to manage the hr as well <laughs> who's upset with who yeah. and you got to be like a nanny to kind of like you know i'll figure that would be everything. a manager's role to kind of like do but hey you know what do i know <laughs> yeah so the leader has okay. to do everything <laughs> <clears throat> so so yeah, skip that. Right? I, I I used to come from a gaming background, so that's why I got quite a few questions about competitive gaming. I'm just curious to do mm-hmm. how how the world works, right? So yeah, so I'd like to hear from you know what are the different levels of of uh competitive gaming, right? So for example, I believe there is the like the hobbies, right? Playing maybe one two hours a week. Then they have those like playing five ten hours a week. Then those who are more serious, blah blah blah. So how many levels do you think there is before they reach the level that you did at the international level? So in in every single game, like in every sport and every single game, the top 300 or 500 players in the world are not good. Um, you have to be within the top 1% of that to be on a pro level. So like you'll play uh, like ranked games or whatever. And if you happen to team up with people who are like rank, let's just say rank 200, rank 300, rank 150, Every single one of those players will get trashed by a professional player. So the difference between those players and professionals is really just that the professionals are on another level in terms of skill, in terms of communication, and in terms of strategy. Um, the only way really to kind of pick up those skills is to actually be a part of a team. So if you are just good at kind of like playing the game normally, but don't know how to play within a team environment and know how strategies work, then you'll never be um, capable of playing on a professional level and the difference will always be there mm, wow. and what's the average lifespan of a a professional gamer 
I'd say thir- I, th- I think people in their 30s is kind of where it starts to top off. But um, the way like kind of these uh, teams work is usually you have a fresh mix of like older vet- veteran talent. So people in their late 20s, 30s. And then you have kind of like newcomer rookies who are like, just like highly gifted mechanically and have no fear. And those people are usually like 17, 18, 19 years old kind of players, very flashy. And uh, it's kind of a balance. Like it, Most teams that are skewed too heavily one way or the other are not really that successful. It's usually having the wisdom and the experience to share and pass down to temper young individuals, but also like having younger people bring in innovation and just being quicker, you know, to react and not having as much baggage because things are always changing. Like the game is always updating and improving and like it's harder for older people to just constantly pick up new things over and over again. Earlier you mentioned gifted mechanically. What 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 does that mean? I think just when you're younger you, you just have uh the synapses are just firing you know, like much quicker. Like you are connecting the dots quicker you're reacting and adapting quicker you, and like i said you don't have the baggage so like a veteran player would be like oh you know like five years ago that was the preferred strategy and this is how we played it but like newer people they don't think about that they just see like what works now and they're like this works and i'm gonna do this and so they don't bring any preconceived notions into the game and i just think overall their um their ability to basically put pressure on their bodies is much higher. Like I don't have as much tolerance, for example, with how long I can sit at the desk without like getting a back ache or like my hand cramping up or something like that. You know, like young people never have to care about that. You could literally play like 24 hours a day. <laughs> and earlier you also mentioned that when they are younger, they have no fear. So I'm thinking, well, what's that kind of fear that's coming up in gaming? Uh, the I think the fear is just being able to jump into unknown situations or like doing things really different. Like I think younger players, they don't, they're more innovative in the sense that they, um, they see things differently just because again, like oh, there's no baggage. So like their fearlessness is like, they, they don't see uh, competitors as like out of reach. They just think of, them as like people that they're going to dominate they're like they're like i'm going to go in and just going to crush you and uh older people are like you know this guy's a legend like he did this he did that right. and like, i looked up to that guy you know there's, so much, there's a lot of things that just psychologically affect you i can relate to that so it's like you see like a pro player someone who's like a legendary status and you meet him in battle there's that fear sometimes might even cripple you or you know kind of like hold you back in terms of a, a mental capacity where you just get nervous and you can your your clicks might even fumble right especially uh, back then for me I was playing counter strike you know you know you see the opponent and you just kind of like freeze yeah. when you see like a you know someone with a godlike status in front of you <laughs> okay and have you ever talked to like a i i talk to young traders all the time and i'm like you gotta be really safe with your risk management and they're like no, screw you. I'm going like 10% risk per trade. I'm going to be a millionaire tomorrow. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, stop. And they just don't care. Like they literally, I think it's just because they have nothing to lose. I, I think that's really what it is. Like when you're older, you're like, oh, I, I can't let these people down. I have to, I'm responsible for this or whatever. And they're like, they, they just don't care. You know, they, they really can just go in completely reckless and just find out by making mistakes. They don't care about wisdom. <laughs> it's probably a rites of passage that I think all of us have to go through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so after the, the international competition, you guys placed well, right? Top eight. And then uh, you kind of like decided to, you know, I can't do this anymore. You know, then that's where you make the transition to, to trading. So before the transition to trading, what was the top process in your head to kind of realize, man, this is not something that, you know, I want to do for the rest of my life or for the next five or 10 years? Uh, a lot of it was kind of those emotional issues I mentioned where I've had players in the midst of tournaments are like $3 million prize pool. They shut down completely. Uh, like literally we're in a room together, sit on the chair, sit on a swivel chair, flip completely opposite of the team, just like facing a wall, ask them questions. They won't say anything in front of your manager, in front of the people, person who owns the freaking company, completely shut, shut down. Uh, totally uncooperative like 
given up and i'm like dude this is not possible or people will have a uh, feuds with each other and will refuse to talk to each other or like come to meetings or or just be active and and helping the team and for just the most uh, stupid reasons ever um, and so like when that happens you're just like dude like it doesn't matter um, how much work i'm putting in because it only takes one person to ruin the entire team and i don't i don't care if they're the best players or what um that literally just attitude can sink the ship so i've been in so many situations like that where um like i'll give you a really good example like there was this tournament where we were going to qualify for the international and i was playing against my my former teammates who we also qualified for the national the year before and uh instead of practicing for that tournament one of my teammates who's like a young guy decided to go to edc which is elect electronic uh, dance music festival in las vegas and he's like no nah, i'm not going to practice i'm just going to go do some drugs and like w listen to music for like a week and i was like Are, you can't be serious right and so he left us as four players to practice without him for this entire time um and when he came back he's like what's up guys let's play and i was like dude come on <laughs> and the difference between us qualifying for the international which had like a I think it was probably like a uh, probably eight to twelve million prize pool at the time. Um, was literally one game. Like we needed to win one game um, in the final, and this guy like did not practice with us the whole week because he won he didn't care. And so th there's just situations like that where you're like, why is my fate in these people's hands? If I could just do this by myself, it would be so much easier. And that's why trading was so appealing because I was like, I don't have teammates anymore. <laughs> like, I, w I was sick of teammates. I don't want to have teammates. I want to just be able to rely on myself because I know that, like, y you can only control what you do. I mean, you can try to influence people, but at the end of the day, if they if they're irrational, like, there's what what can you do about it? Have you ever thought then maybe I should play games that are individual solo like? So Street Fighter that comes to mind, uh, Starcraft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I love I do love team games though. I think there's something about the camaraderie and like just having this uh, group that becomes like a family. They become like your brothers, and every, when you win, it's so much sweeter because everyone's there with you, right? Um, that's just the game I love. That's the game I I committed my life to. So I there was no other game. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it came with the risk where one player could just couldn't give a rip about you know the consequences and just you know kind of yolo and do whatever he wants at the expense of the entire team. Yeah, it's it's really it's I I'm gonna write a book about it one day. Just I have so many stories that you would never <laughs> believe it. Like there's a guy, he would, we needed a fifth player, and we paid him a salary, and we're like, hey, come over here, like you're talented, we can win with you. He joined for one day after signing the contract. We played like three games, and he quit the next day right before we had a qualification tournament for the international game. So like we uh, at that moment we had to find another player at the last second and he completely breached his contract and we did, I don't know if we pursued it but like he just decided oh never mind like I don't want to do this and he never competed again. He never played on another team. <laughs> like, I was like what happened to this guy? <laughs> uh, and I I I'd like to hear the story of where I think I read on your blog post that you guys upset one of the top contenders in the international, right? And that's why you guys made it mm -hmm. to the top eight. What what was it like, you know, upsetting, you know? I mean, you guys clearly were the underdog. So how was how was the entire, how did the entire thing play out? I mean, it's so, it's so much easier being the underdog. I love, you know, everyone loves being an underdog because there's no pressure. Uh, this team was like the second, they placed second <laughs> at the last international. So they're like a heavy favorite. And only that, but at the time, China was the number one region in the world like every every team from china is expected to win this tournament and the funny thing is like when you play versus a chinese team you're not just playing against one team you're playing against all of china the reason why is because when they scrim and when they practice and when they go to the ti which is international they literally help each other they don't care which team wins they just want a chinese team to win so like you're playing against like three or four chinese teams that are the best in the world who are like collaborating with each other whereas like on the american eu side Nobody wants to talk to each other. No one wants to help each other. 
And so like, you just feel like this, the odds are stacked because you could have been practicing for someone and they leak your whole strategy to another team. <laughs> so like, we're playing in those kind of odds and basically like, no one expects us to win. We go into the game and it's very slow, but eventually we just started picking up this momentum. And eventually at some point we're like, wait, we can actually win this game. And once once that triggered in our minds, like we everyone got so hyper, like we got so hype and like we just started making plays that we never made before, just super in the flow and catching them off guard and just creating like a lot of chaos. And like that was one of those games where like every single thing you did right, like even if you walked the right way, like literally because everyone's watching you, right? Even if you just walk the right way, the crowd is cheering for everything you're doing. <laughs> and so like we're like it felt like we could do nothing wrong and every single play that worked we just kept getting more cheers and more claps and stuff like that so it's like let's keep doing it and eventually we just won the game and like uh, the entire crowd was like on their feet everyone was just super excited like there's a bunch of recordings online where like my teammate literally ripped his headphones off before the game was even over and just started running out on the stage because we were so happy and we like everyone was treating like USA, USA, USA. And I was, I was so happy. But like the thing that we didn't realize is that you can't celebrate your wins too early. So like we were so happy that we didn't even think about the next game at all. And that was a very tight game. We lost that to another Chinese team, which was also favorite. And it was like, I learned at that moment, like you just can't celebrate your wins too soon. Like you still have a job to do. Like you, you have to be like, okay, we won. This is awesome. But then, like, go back to work. So that could have been a miracle run that we just kind of cut short because of our own uh, like happiness. I guess like we never really got that far in anything. So <laughs> it's too weird. I can imagine the the crowd. So I, I believe the Chinese team were they were like silent, like you know, all they are cursing all the <laughs> the vulgarities in their head as you guys are uh, yeah winning the game. <laughs> okay, so now let's, let's make. make... Let's move on to, to, to trading. We talked quite a bit on gaming and then, yeah, I really enjoyed that portion, man. Mm-hmm. And you talk about why you, you wanted to leave uh, gaming because of, you know, uh, teamwork do comes with its disadvantages as well. So so how do you first get exposed to trading? Um, I was always thinking about investing afterwards with my funds because I knew that uh, gaming might not last forever. And so uh, originally, I was just going to invest in the stock market. But I learned that with trading, you could actually do a lot more. And I didn't necessarily leave esports with the amount of money that I wanted. So, um, like, I I would say I walked away with esports with, like, less than 100K, 50, 1500K. And um, after taxes got worse. So it's kind of like, I didn't think that I could retire on that. Like, I in my, in my vision of playing as an esports player, I was like, I'm going to place highly at TI. And I'll probably walk away with a couple hundred thousand dollars. I can invest that and I'll be good. But cutting my career a bit short, I was like, no, I, I think I have to trade. And so, um, you know, just YouTube, it, you, you go on YouTube, you find a lot of different things. And um, it's very, very appealing, right? <laughs> they mar- the marketing is very good. I can say that. So you just like, okay, well, I mean, like, uh, it's faster, less risk. Okay. Let's, I mean, you think it's less risk because you're, in and out and you don't have to like hold through things but um of course there's actually more risk in a way so yeah i got i just got into the, just to the marketing channels basically and i think i i i heard somewhere about your journey on learning how to trade so how do you then learn how to trade or rather how do you find your age in the markets uh, i think i think the, what i trade is very heavily marketed so it wasn't difficult necessarily to find edge i think it was difficult to like figure out who understood the edge well so a lot of people just kind of rely on the fact that uh small caps have like certain percentage tendencies because a lot of them are gaps and gaps tend to like fill and things like that so people could rely on just the overall kind of like mechanics of gaps to explain why there's edge but um there's actually a lot more that goes into it in terms of like doing fundamental analysis and technical analysis. It's not all just like things gap and then you trade them. Um, so like 
I think naturally what people do is they, uh, well, what you should do actually, people go to YouTube, but I went to Twitter and I just started finding people who I felt like were credible and just investigate their thoughts and their feeds and eventually figured out like who I thought was legit and then just started cutting out people. Got scammed a couple of times, got um, into bad chat rooms or whatever, or paid for things that weren't very good. But like at the end of the day, I could just figure out, okay, I don't trust this person anymore and just unfollow them. And eventually just narrowed it down to like one or two people and studied everything they had to say. And it was constantly hitting. Like what they were saying was constantly congruent with the market. So I was like, okay, they, these people understand the best. And so that was all I had to, to focus on. So you mentioned about Twitter. I'd like to hear more about how you use Twitter to then find people that you want to learn from. I believe you use probably the search function, but is there any more things that you can expand on? Yeah, so uh, early on, I learned that on Twitter, there's like, like the cash tag kind of feature where if you, you, know, you use the dollar sign and put the symbol, it'll connect you with other people who are trading similar things. So like naturally in a small, small community, like the small cap space that I traded, you would see reoccurring characters a lot of times. And uh, I also tried to participate in that by like putting the cash tags of the stocks I was trading or that I was watching and making comments about it or like sharing my charts or my, or my thoughts. And eventually like just started to understand who was consistently here and started sending messages out like, Hey, you know, like I see that you traded this and I was curious if you want to talk to me about it or like if you could look at my stuff. And what I did was I basically um, used the feed as a kind of like journal slash uh, content blog where like, even if I didn't know anything, I was just kind of explaining what, how my trading journey was like and what my ambitions were and stuff like that. And so I think, when I was sending out messages and stuff like that, people saw my feed was not just like an empty thing with like an egg. Uh, it was actually like someone really trying to do this. And so that I think that attracted people towards me. But uh, more or less, like, I, th I think I only really made a couple really good friends on Twitter. The main way was like making one friend who knew other friends, right? And then they just, you just kind of bring other connections from your like you know you know and trust and really like someone and then their friends come in so they, they have, they're more trustable as well and you just kind of create a group and then at that point like you're just pulling resources because it's kind of like you know if you have five five ten guys in one room and someone sees something or sees some kind of information that's relevant they'll pull it in and you just have like this aggregator of information that, and to me that was like the most helpful at the time so when you say small cap stocks, are they like below a certain market capitalization that you trade? Yeah, in the they're like stocks that are below um like fifteen dollars, so like one to fifteen dollars. They can they can be below a dollar as well. The market caps are usually less than like hundred million, like very small companies. The floats are very varying sizes, but considered low float, like relative to everything else. So could you then we share a little bit more about your trading methodology to how you trade the markets today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I trade primarily mean reversion strategies. And so uh, I do that to the short side just because a lot of the small cap companies are very volatile and they move large percentages. So it it's easier basically to let it come to you. I mean, obviously you can do mean reversion both ways. But just the nature of this market, it lends itself more towards the short side because there's constantly new uh, candidates to evaluate versus kind of like trying to pick bottoms, which is like in a small cap. You know, if you're picking a bottom on a small cap, you're basically catching a falling knife uh, versus like if you're dip buying the spy during like COVID or something like that. That's a good meter version trade. So kind of like I can't really I don't really trust the company's long side. Uh, meet, so I am trading mean version. And I am systematizing it so that I can eliminate kind of like the discretion in terms of like using signals to know when to start in or to build a, build a position. And I'm typically starting in very small as there's the most risk when you're kind of like 
lower probabilities and it's going against you. But I will typically manage risk very tightly, get back in and build positions based on price action working my favor. And usually that is kind of like enhanced by um, fundamentals, technical analysis, understanding of the market psychology at the time, and cycles, and uh, being able to understand like news. So combining all those four things really helps with this uh, disadvantage. Okay, that's that's quite a quite a handful over there. So let's kind of like unpack them one by one. So just to make sure we're on the same page. So when you say mean reversion trading uh, on the short side, I'm imagining that it's maybe a stock that has made a, a parabolic move for whatever catalyst or reason, and then you're looking to short that move down lower in anticipation that you know that move is it's a fake breakout or something along those lines. Yes, I, these okay. moves are like sometimes thousand percent move. You know, something very insane. 50%, 100%, 300%. These are very large moves, right? Like you don't see those in large caps, which is kind of where the opportunity lies. It's just that the volatility allows you to take advantage of these ranges. I mean, even if if something does a normal correction of like 50% or something like that, when it ran up very large percentage, you know, there's still like a lot of uh, meat on the bone. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm visualizing that the stock is in a downtrend and then for whatever news or reason, boom, right, we have this huge spike up 1,000, 2,000 percent and then you're looking mm-hmm. to, to short it because you don't believe this stock is valued at this, whatever this price is. So then what's kind of like the next step? What kind of like gives you a trigger to say, oh, now it's it's the time to enter or let's wait and see you know, if it goes up higher? What's, what's your top process when you see such a pattern? So there, you pretty much start understanding that each type of mean aversion trade has different variations like some of them have technical setups like they run into certain resistances or they um trap one they trap longs like in a sense of you know you mentioned fake breakout that's a perfect example just something where everyone is anticipating a bigger move and the stock stuffs really quickly and starts selling off like those kind of moves trigger additional selling pressure um there's, but most of the times it has to do with like uh, fundamental pressure. So these companies are usually trying to raise capital in order to stay alive. And so they do it by means of dilution or offerings. And when you can kind of understand the way that companies raise capital from the markets, um, you recognize that they're, at, they're either adding additional supply to the market, which creates that mean version trade, or they'll do like very quick offerings that will, um, impact price rather quickly like you'll see these 20 30 40 percent drops instantaneously on news of like pending offering or like an offering that's effective or something like this and so that risk gives a benefit to the short sellers because we're able to kind of uh, anticipate that or play around the fact that those companies do need to use dilution to raise capital okay so maybe before they they try to raise capital there's a spike up higher. What usually led to the huge spike up higher? Uh, it's it's typically manipulation. Uh, these companies hire institutions that specialize in generating liquidity. So a lot of these companies do not trade actively every single day. They typically trade very sporadically. And usually when they do it, it's based on news or based on some sort of uh, like literal, literally manipulation from these institutions. So essentially, like you're like, hey, my company is going to be bankrupt in like three months. Um, what can we do about that? You have run and done offerings for a lot of these companies in similar situations. Could you help me out? And they'll be like, yes. But in order to do that, I we need to strike a deal where you you give me something in return. So they'll basically be like, as part of the uh, dilution process, we're going to give you some percentage of the uh, additional shares that you can raise capital on your own. And so those companies will are then incentivized to run the stock as high as possible so that not only are they raising capital for the company themselves, but they're going to have a, like a huge sweetener deal, such as like hugely in the money and warrants or additional shares that they can just sell off onto the market and generate like large, large, large amount of capital. So basically, the higher, the better you know, for them. As the incentives match at that point. Right. Oh, that's really insightful. I, I, I didn't, 
I, I'm not in a small cap space, so this is uh, very new to me. So, okay, we have a, a huge spike run up and it's backed by fundamentals because companies is, is trash, is trying to raise capital to survive. So that's why supply will come in. When supply will come in, naturally the stock price will, will go down and whoever buy that highs get caught holding the back. So since you have this uh, kind of like inside note, when supply comes in, the price is about to hit down lower. So where, you know, where do you feel it's a good time to enter the tree, to go short? Mm-hmm. So personally, I never, I try not to guess my entry. I systematize it in the sense that I try to create a signal that will put a probability on a level holding based on selling pressure. So like I'm never adding or starting a position into a straight up spike because if you do that, you're basically entering where there's 0% probability. Like you have no idea if it will continue going higher or what, because buying pressure is just based on momentum. However, like if the stock, if the stock starts giving signs of selling pressure, you can now start assigning like a probability towards that risk. So you can say like, hey, it started. this is the full, first pullback it ever had. It might have like a 5% chance of holding. Like at that point, maybe not enough risk. But when it starts creating structure, let's say like putting in lower highs or, uh, you know, whatever, head and shoulders patterns, whatever, that's a very basic technical analysis. But like, I'm just trying to illustrate basically like you can essentially assign probabilities to your risk and start putting position sizes that match that probability. So you know, if you have a 50% chance of the risk holding, you can maybe put on half of your position, right? And essentially, like, I've systematized that using indicators that are based on price action. So if if the stock starts pulling back and starts being weak, I'll be able to get in with a small amount of size. And then eventually, I'll start having confirmation signals that are, like, much safer signals. And those will allow me to go in uh, full size and I may try to add into the winner as well to um, increase the win and pull my stop down to basically compensate for that risk. So I'm putting in more position, but you know I'm pyramiding the strategy basically um, at times. Other, otherwise, like you know, you're just putting a risk on the high. And my main advantage basically is like I'm very risk reward focused. So basically, I don't really care if I lose necessarily because I know that when I win, it's going to be much larger than those losses. Especially if you position size this way. You mentioned that you, I mean, the inverse of catching a falling knife is, I guess, you don't shot a rocket that's taking off. <laughs> that's how I yeah. interpret it. So you then you mentioned you would assign a probability, like for example, if you mix a head and shoulders pattern, right? You know, how do you then assess a probability? Let's say if a head and shoulders pattern form, right? How do you then assess? Let's say there's a thirty percent probability of it reversing mm-hmm. down lower. How do you like? come up with that figure is based on maybe the structure that you see on the chart so i don't i was using that as a way to illustrate it and for people to understand it on a basic level but the the true logic is like using indicators that you can back test so basically if you have enough samples of a similar scenario you can say like i can use x indicator like x moving average or whatever um as a signal and i can go over all those charts and say like when that moving average cross or when this moving average form a cup or whatever it is uh, that produced like a 50% win rate on that signal and so you can go into those the, the next trade with the understanding that you have back tested something that on the same niche within the same samples and you can put on the risk pretty confidently at that point because like I mean mean reversions typically you're just trying to like you're mostly trying to trying to pick the top in a way or you're trying to pick the bottoms but uh, I think it's not really intelligent to try to get in the way of like a runaway train or whatever. Like you, you don't want to step in front of the momentum. Instead, you want to like see signs of reversing or um, like some people would say capitulation and essentially like using that information to make an educated, like a risk aware bet that there's a, decent chance that this will hold and so um it's a lot of back testing to figure that out but it's not really difficult because mean reversions in a way are just kind of like uh making a parabolic move and then topping out or bottoming out and then just going the other way like it's really just kind of trying to catch the back side of that okay we'll get to the back test uh part in the moment but for now i just want to just kind of follow through right now I have an understanding of uh, how you enter, right? Basically, letting the market show you a market structure, a price structure that sellers are coming in, right? Take a position. 
So what about stops? Right? Where do you then place your stops right, to, to get out of the trade if you're wrong or proven wrong? Mm -hmm. So those, those signals are meant to put a probability on like the most extreme point. So like if something made like an all-time high, right, then you would probably assign a probability to that high. Like that's the most obvious point to place a stop because that's where the selling actually overwhelmed the demand at that point in time. And so you typically would put a stop there. Now you can like put more risk against that. So you can say like, I'm in half size now, I'm going to go full size. And that that's helpful for like using the same resistance level. But as the trade moves on, like mean reversion trades typically turn into trending stocks in a way. So like, you know, the difference between like a range bound stock is that it's just ping ponging between two ranges. But a trending stock is going to, do like lower highs or higher lows, et cetera, and just constantly um, do these retests, finding sellers or buyers, and then just going the other way, depending upon if they're still there. And so if you recognize that it's a trending market, you can basically move your stops with the actual trend. And so that's a lot more discretionary. There, there's not really a good way to systematize that, in my opinion, but there are ways that you can kind of like dumb it down to learn. So for example, like if you're just trying to learn how to do it, you could say at this third signal or whatever, I will put on like 50% size or something like that. Just like some very generic number and you know that it'll always pull your stop down a certain amount. That's a very good way to just kind of introduce yourself to the idea. But eventually it's mostly discretionary. You have to really have a good understanding of a, how, mark, how stocks move, what you're trading. And understanding that you could get stopped at when you're not even wrong. Uh, you try to stack it to where like, you place your stop where you have a very high likelihood that if it gets there that you're wrong, but you're, it's never 100%. So for that reason, I, like, I typically like to use the extremes initially. And um, I always advocate that people don't add to winners and move stops unless they really know what they're doing because it can absolutely kill your strategy and your mental so it's very important that you just understand how to do the basics first. Okay, so from what I'm hearing is that let's say you spot a setup and you enter your first position, your first stops is usually at the extreme high, all-time high, for example, where there's a maximum selling pressure. And let's say if the market uh, progressively moves in your favor, you could scale into your position, meaning adding more size. And then your stops could shift down to maybe, for example, to the, to the, the previous swing high, or something along those lines. So your stops will progressively move in the direction of the trade that's moving in your favor as well progressively. And yeah. uh, and I think uh, from what I also heard, I think maybe from other podcasts, is that your risk is always the initial risk that you have set for yourself and not anything more. Because sometimes if you, let's say for example, your original stop is at the all-time high, you add a new position, but you don't shift your stops. Now your risk has increased right, because of the new position that you have taken up. Okay, got it. So when yeah. you talk about scaling in, right? So now I have an understanding of how you set your, your, your entries and your, your stops, right? When you talk about scaling in, uh, what are some of the things you look for before you, you scale in, into your trade? Like I said, I'm very, I'm very systematic in this way. Oh. So I, I build out systems that will, or indicators that will capture these moves. Um, however, like as I've advanced as a trader, I, I'm definitely a little bit more discretionary. Sometimes it bites me in the ass like with those ads but i feel like you can't really achieve like the maximum potential if you don't use discretion at that point um, which is why i consider it like very advanced for traders to actually do uh, but essentially like what i would do is just use higher time frame confirmation signals so like for example if you if you use a signal on like the one or five minute chart you'll generally get a signal that's like relatively quick but if you use a signal that's like 15 minutes, it's only going to trigger possibly once or twice within that trend. So like the reason why you wouldn't solely use that is because you're not going to get in like where you have a good risk reward. But because it's so lagging um, and confirmed, like those probabilities of it holding or like being an effective signal are like much higher probabilities. So, like you could boost your probabilities from like 50% to, you know, 75 to 90 percent and those are really good points to add because essentially like it's showing you that the, the stock is doing exactly what you want it to do 
it's it's trending and it's going in your direction very heavily. So at the, at that point, I would basically make that decision, or I would uh, use the uh, predefined uh, position sizing as well if I was a beginner. But now I adjust it to the exact level. So am I right to say that when you scale into your positions, usually you're doing it more on a pullback rather than on a breakup? Uh, I could I could do both. So basically, like typically, my signals are I'm only adding two winners, so all my signals are within my direction. So I might have like three signals. So the first signal is like starter put on fifty percent, and then the second one might be like put on the full size. So now we're risking the full R, and then. The third signal might be like, let's move our stop. So let's put on more position and move our stop accordingly. And if you can basically take that as far as you want, you can add like as many times as uh, as possible. You just have to recognize that the the more you add like closer towards your targets or towards the mean version, the less expected value of each trade. Like imagine if you just put on a trade at that moment where you added, the risk reward is not very good, right? But the win rate's high. So it's kind of like, there's an art of balancing that to the point where you don't like obliterate your average cost too much. Um, and typically, like the reason why they call it pyramiding is because you're usually like adding less size as it goes on, so that you don't you're just getting bigger, but you're not killing your trade. And it's just how, it's just sweetening the deal so that you your winners are that much bigger than your losers. And in the long run, that helps a lot in helping you be consistently profitable. Hmm. Would you say that a huge part of your age comes from scaling into your trades? What if you don't scale in your trades? It's just kind of like entry stops and targets. How, how would things change for you? Not much, actually. It's a... Uh, like, even if you have a higher win rate and a lower risk reward, there are a lot of things you can do to optimize that. Like, you can increase your, your initial position size. You could... Uh, you have the benefit of, like, much less drawdowns, you know? And... Um, in terms of growing your account, like I, I compound my account. So if you have a higher win rate, you're naturally going to compound your account like very effectively because you're not really taking losses necessarily. So you could have a very conservative strategy. Um, I think the edge really comes down to can you consistently do it? And being consistent allows you to basically plug that into like, let's say, an equity curve simulator and understand like if your trajectory is positive and uh, not just good, like it should be a great trajectory because of human nature. Like you're going to make mistakes and you're going to pay fees and stuff like that. So understanding if you can create a baseline strategy that will produce a positive expectation, performing as well as you can close to that, and then optimizing in terms of like, can I add? Can I increase my position size? Can I use more risk? Um, and how much drawdown am I willing to tolerate? Like all of those factors allows you to compound your account uh, pretty safely, I would say. But the overall edge is not like, it's not about risk reward or anything like that. Uh, you still need to have good stock selection. You still need to have a good understanding of like the mass market psychology. And, um, you know, sometimes like if the psychology of the market, for example, like during COVID, like everything was grossly exaggerated. I mean, you could, you could see a move that typically would go, you know, 50% spike going 500% just because of the mania. Uh, or you could see, you know, GameStop, AMC, whatever, all these stocks just ripping higher than anyone thought. And um, you just have to be able to recognize, like, what is the environment that I'm trading and be able to adapt to that. Otherwise, you will just basically um, get frustrated. And, uh, you know, that awareness is something that you just get from experience. And I think you get experience from just... Uh, position sizing correctly so that you have enough attempts to just keep losing, keep making mistakes and stay in the market. So like all in all, just there is a, a lot of edge in a lot of different things you do. It's kind of like the culmination of that. But at the end of the day, if you don't pick the right stocks, you can't make money. <laughs> like, that's important. Okay. And you earlier spoke about the market environment. So are you like kind of referring to generally what the overall stock market is doing as a whole in terms of the market environment? No, it's a well. You do want to you do want to know about it just in case. So in certain circumstances, like with the interest rates increasing, the macro environment causes a kind of like a depression in the small cap space. But if all things are going well, like it's a pretty healthy market, bull market, 
there's more money going around. People are more risky with their money, and so they'll be in, investing in small caps. And uh, small caps will make bigger moves. So that's typically when you have a green light. But even within that, there are cycles within the small cap space, and it really largely revolves around um, who's in control. So like, are the long buyers in control or the short sellers in control? Or are, um, is there no edge? Like it's just completely neutral. So during during the kind of like recession-ish time in 2022, there was not really much opportunity in terms of like, either it was a neutral cycle. So the, within that time frame, there was not much going on. But like typically it's not like that. Typically it's like one side's getting greedy. One side is being... Uh, very aggressive and usually they get caught so it's kind of like as much as it sounds kind of like oh yeah i just show up and just short everything um the fact of the matter is like the market is hyper aware that short sellers exist and short sellers lead to squeezes like short sellers are the reason why you know gamestop and amc go went insane right um sh- when shorts get aggressive and to you know, focus on kind of growing their accounts and stuff like that, it creates these insane squeezes. And that's when people blow up. That's when, that's where the risk comes in trading. And that's where the awareness really needs to be there uh, and the risk management. Otherwise, um, you can feel like you're winning every day, but get overconfident and just lose everything in one, day, one or two days. So when the shots get squeezed, is that where you come into kind of like shot the parabolic move higher? To see if you no, I get, let it... I get squeezed to be honest. But the thing is, like, I get squeezed, but um, and there's not really that much you can do about it. Like, you can you can kind of brace for it, but uh, the thing is, I don't really care. Like, I I, I risk very uh, modestly to the point where even if I take a max loss something like that, it's just kind of okay. Like, you got me today. Um, the idea is that it's always going to happen. It's kind of like you know, if you play poker, um you kind of have to take bets, right? Like you're going to lose sometimes. It's it's not like you're going to win all the time. Sometimes you have good hand, you place a bet, you lose. Um, chips are just constantly cycling across the table. That, that's the way I see it. It's like um, as a trader, it basically I lose as much money as I make. It's just that the amount I make is in the aggregate. It's just bigger than how much I lose. So that's the net P&L. But I still would say like if you looked at my gross P&L loss, uh, it's still relatively high, you know. It's like I, I'm giving as much as I'm taking, basically. So it's fine. It's, that's natural and normal. Okay, so so far we have talked about the the setup, the entry, the stops. Now let's talk about targets, right? So where do you kind of like think, right? You no, know, it's time to to exit the trade for a profit. Mm. So y- there's a couple different ways. So there's technical. So sometimes, like I mentioned, gaps they tend to fill. Um, stocks that gap up, they create that downward pressure uh you have also technical levels as such as uh breakout levels or levels on the chart that have like significant vault trading volume that can you can use as like consolidation areas stuff like that um and then there are fundamental levels like sometimes it's literally like written out in plain english like we are going to dilute based off of this exercise price of a warrant and it's like Okay, well, if there's so much in the money stock, then why not just run it down, you know, as much as we can? So if, sometimes it's explicit, other times it's not. Um, and then there's like the uh, systematic way, which is like using indicators that you can backtest. And those would be mean reversion indicators like moving averages, or um, you could use like Fibonacci retracements, things like that. Like it's not like, it's not like an entirely um, scientific Fibonacci, for example, but like in terms of mean inversion, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it doesn't matter uh, if it goes to the 50% retracement or 70% or 60%, whatever, as long as you can backtest that out and figure out if that is consistent. And if it's consistent, that's good enough. Um, I have multiple targets. So it's kind of like I read the room, whatever the price action is telling me like if there's like a lot of selling pressure if i if i notice that or if i notice like it's kind of thin and i feel like this market is really absorbing a lot of sell- like selling pressure it's like really there is demand at these levels um if i'm seeing that like i'm reacting to it but like 
I would say I probably have like four. No, I probably have like eight different price targets actually. And people think that you just need one or two, but I'm very adaptive in that sense. And I know which setups use which ones and which kind of price action corresponds with different price targets. So, you know, I kind of use all of them and uh, they're all mean, revert- mean reversion like thought process, basically. Could you perhaps give an example? I mean, you have eight, like, like one example of how you would exit the trade based on one of your eight targets. Yeah, so I typically, I operate from the mindset of like, what is my most conservative target? So based on this setup, what can I generally expect to hit like most of the times? And usually that will be like a very, um, like a faster kind of moving average potentially, or like a, let's say, if, if we use Fibonacci, for example, you could say like, like a 50% retracement, right? But obviously there's like potentially more uh, left in the tank. So basically when it gets to those conservative targets, I'm I'm looking at the time and sales level two and also the chart. And I'm trying to see like, is the selling pressure sustained? Do I feel like this level is going to break? Do I feel like there's more meat on the bone? And that would be like the main way. And I would have a stretch target and be like, okay, now let's repeat the process at the stretch target. And I'm not trying to catch the exact bottom tick or the low or whatever. I'm trying to catch the reversal. So I'm trying to look for the moment. It's like mean reverting again. Like <laughs> like you mean revert one time to short and then you mean revert to long basically, but you're, that's a cover. So um, it's just doing the opposite, literally. Like you just systematize what would be the long entry. And that is the short cover. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I never really thought about that way, but that that's exactly what it is. Right. So from what I'm hearing, it's like you're, Although you mentioned, you know, mean reverting, but it seems like you're actually a, sort of like a trend trader, but towards the short side, you try to capture the meat of the, the move, right? Because you're not selling at the absolute highs or buying at the absolute lows. Yeah, the so, meat. Yeah. So let's talk now about backtesting. Earlier, you, you, you were talking about it. So I'd like to hear your process, right, of, you know, doing your backtest to gain confidence in, in your trading system. Yeah, so I try to collect as many samples as possible. The good thing about my market is that we just get so much frequency that you can literally get like 100, 200 samples in a couple months. And so um, the nature of that is basically I just, I screenshot everything. So my scan is always picking up the same stocks or the same type of stocks. And from there, I'm going to categorize them like, oh, this is this setup, this is that setup. And then I'll just screenshot all of them. I'll screenshot the intraday chart, the higher time frame, and then like the daily chart. And um, typically, I'll just kind of save those charts with like my indicators on them. Uh, but if I was like completely going to backtest a new system, I would basically just be archiving those trades so that I have a list of like, this is the date, this is the tickers that I was interested in watching based on my scan. And you want to you want to try to basically scan, uh, tune your scanner so that you're only picking up more or less trades that you would be interested in taking. And so from that point, you take it a step further, and you could do like a the analysis I mentioned, like you do the technical fundamental news and cycle analysis, which I call I just I just call that the four pillars. And basically you do a pillars analysis and figure out furthermore if that would categorize that setup as a specific um, trade, trading setup. So is it a fundamental trade? Is it a technical trade? Is it a uh, is it a trade based on uh supply or is it a trade based on the fact that like there's so many traders trading it and there could potentially be a trap or there could be like a, it's just way too overextended statistically there's a high edge. So in those cases, you kind of have different set of expectations. And uh, literally what I'll do is I'll just go on my, um, my charting platform. So I like Thinkorswim a lot and I will first I'll, I'll just think of like, what's my problem? Like uh, what is the issue that I'm trying to solve? I'm trying to, find an entry signal. So I'll just isolate it to one thing and I'll be like, what are indicators that I could use to uh, coincide with entry signal? So like you can it you can literally use anything. Like there there are so many types of indicators, stuff like that, and they're all pretty fleshed out. Like I don't really see uh, how it's not useful because I think that at the end of the day all they need to do is provide, provide a probability. So I think it's more useful actually to just throw up indicators that you believe have a the characteristics that would uh, match like entries or exits, for example, which is whatever you're focusing on. So for example, like 
like oscillators is a good example. If you use like an oscillator like RSI or something, then extension can be measured basically by overbought. And you would have like the default settings, right? But essentially what you could do is like put that on your chart and tune it, fine tune it so that on the samples that you have in your niche, that it's more reactive and more more accurate. And what you'll find is like on all types of signals, like the sh- the smaller time frame signals are always very noisy. Like you'll get like ten signals or whatever. And the goal is basically to scale that up, like either change the values for yourself to create the conditions where it has is less noisy, or just literally bump it up, like from one minute to five minutes to whatever. Um, and in doing so, you'll notice like the characteristics of indicators is that they are getting less and less noisy the higher the time frames you go up. And so it's about recognizing like can I create probabilities based on these signals? Can I reduce the noise? Or can I like take a noisy signal, pair it with something else, and create an invalidation factor? So if you maybe had like five signals and you're like, this is way too noisy, you add another layer on top of that, maybe another indicator or another price action condition. And you make sure it's as black and white as possible so that you can re- recognize it in real time. And basically, like that will help you reduce the signals from like five signals to maybe two signals. And two signals for an aggressive entry is rather good. I mean, if you can put on a starting position, like lose quarter R, half an R, put on another position and that one works, like I would take that any day. And the advantage of this is that you get a good risk reward because you're starting in uh, much closer to the mean reversion point. And from that position, you can build out quite a much better position because of the uh, ability to have like a higher average cost or like a more comfortable average cost in that case. And uh, you can put on more more position size basically as it's working versus if you try to go so slow that you're prioritizing win rate and then you have very low risk reward, which is completely fine. I mean, I think you can go either way. That's the beauty of trading is that you can tune your stats how you feel comfortable. But for me, like I'm very aggressive. I want to take part in a lot of moves. Like I have FOMO, so I, it's hard for me to like wait for signals like that. So for me, I go for aggressive signals, and I pair that with slower, more disciplined signals to really make it work. And really, all that is is just so you put up those in, whatever indicators you're interested in. You might put on like different variations just so you can see all at the same time. Start literally like go on demand, think or slim, go start at the earliest point you can type in the symbols one by one just look at it you can you can find out if it works in like literally five seconds i'll be like oh this doesn't work oh this works this works this has a 50 percent win rate uh, the more astute people might put it into excel and add like the numbers stuff like that but for me the visual confirmation is enough if i if i see literally like three months of this and i know like this signal is just is working uh, for me that's enough and then i'll just literally codify that so basically I'll, I'll create my own script that will add labels or add um alert sounds or whatever and i will say like on the setup this signal is, is meant to work i have back tested on this i know what it looks like i know if it triggers uh like if it repaints for example like a five minute signal might take five minutes to actually confirm and i go in with knowing those flaws and i go in knowing the characteristics trade it live recognize if there was something I overlooked. And if that's the case, then I try to correct that for the next time. Or if I recognize like it's it's just not feasible, then I'll just give it up. And, and I'll just repeat the process. I, I will do I will just back test like nonstop. So if the idea is basically like you you find a situation or a stock price action that you like. Like for example, like a, a mean version, like a massive mean version, like a very good move. You reverse engineer that and then you create a system to capture that in the future. And then if you have basically other situations that are very similar, like you, let's say you have five other stocks that look very similar to that one, you can back test on all those and create a thesis. And then the next time that setup happens, you can apply the system you created to execute on it that would have captured what you missed in the past or what you were interested in. And that's basically how I create new setups. And so the, the idea is basically you just have to recognize when to use a certain system um, and I just kind of like reduce the complexity by focusing on a setup that is very similar to each other or setups that are very similar to each other so that 
I don't have to use too many different sets. Like I probably only have like, well, actually, I don't. I have probably have like uh, three, three or five different sets of indicators, and I know when to use them. And uh, it's all set of dependent. So like, you know, you just build on one by one. I, at the beginning, I had one. I had one. I had two entry signals at the beginning and one price target signal for like a year and a half. Like every single day, that's all I did. But I just recognize like there's so much more nuance that you can build on that. So uh, it's gotten more complex over time, but I, it's really not that necessary. Okay, so from what I'm hearing is, you know, you have uh, different types of trading set up, even though they are trading in a similar methodology, which is shorting stocks. So correct me if I'm wrong. So if one could be, for example, price, you know, making a huge move into a key resistance, an all-time resistance, and you want to see, you know, how you can take advantage of a shorting opportunity towards the mean. Another one could be what you spoke about is stocks, right? Uh, diluting the, the supply, right? Adding more supply because they want to raise money for the shittiest company and you're seeing how you can, <laughs> you know, find a pattern to, to short and go back to the mean. And, and I think these are the few different setups that you have mentioned. And is this what you mean by setups? The context behind the trade? Yes, the context is very important. Uh, okay. A very, like, a really um, common example is called, like, a fail fall through. Basically, it's like a, it's a stock that is, like, ripping you know, insane. And um, there's always a point essentially where like either the last short got squeezed out or the last buyer came in and like had the most FOMO. Um, and they just, you know, a ton of volume goes through, but the stock no longer goes higher. And essentially like that's, that's potential reversal point. And that's completely based on supply and demand. So that's going to trade much differently than let's say a stock that has a constant stream of supply that's coming in from like institutional side. Typically, you know, like even let's let's just take for example in large cap stock. If a if a large institution is trying to accumulate a stock, they're not going to just send a market order of like you know however size they want. They're going to they're going to tier it over time, and basically you know that um, large size needs to trade a specific way. Like they have to be more passive, be more patient, be more trendy, and they may not completely uh, fill their entire order in one day so uh recognizing the difference between like irrational exuberance or trapping behavior and uh institutional behavior is like pretty important okay so once you recognize these different behaviors then you have your different set of custom indicators that tell you when to enter based on the backtesting work that you have done previously yes okay and I, i'm curious let's say you you do a backtest and you realize maybe the indicators, the parameters, you know, it's a negative result, for example. Then what's your process to, you know, uh, refining it or, you know, to abandon it altogether? I, I'm super quick to abandon. Like, I, I'm really just kind of like the, uh, like the Edison, like the way the Edison approach, you know, just try a bunch of things. You know, I've, I've failed like hundreds, thousands of times. And you just, sometimes you find something that sticks. Like you, you find something, uh, the needle in the haystack, it's just, it works. And you're like, I, I understand this. I understand how it moves. I, I'm completely happy with its, with its flaws. And I accept that its strengths like really fit what I'm looking to trade. And, um, you know, there's like this, uh, this, uh, funny quote. I'm going to butcher this, but like Kula Maggie, everyone knows Kula Maggie. Um, uh, I think on one of his streams, someone told me that uh, he had like a 50 moving average, something like that. And the, the chatter was like, was it, was that 50 day moving average for like, do I need to put that on? And he's like, he's like, it doesn't, it doesn't effing matter what this moving average is. It's just, it's, you know, he, he changed it to 69, I think. He's like, I'm just going to use the 69 moving average. I don't care. Because like, ultimately it doesn't really matter uh, what the number is. Like these indicators more or less behave the same. You just kind of have to tune it to, uh, what fits kind of your strategy and what kind of behaviors you expect around it. And it's not going to make a big difference whether you use a one minute uh, moving average, two minutes, five minutes. What you can put it on any random number you want. Uh, the back test is there to validate your idea that it's that, that's feasible. I don't think I've ever shipped an idea that didn't work on the back test. Um, more, most of the ideas fail because of a unseen issue. Like, this is too difficult to execute. Like, no human can execute this. Or, this is too disciplined. Like, I don't have, like, it's very hard for me to wait 
or um, repainting is probably the biggest issue. It's like if you're using a high time frame confirmation, the reason why it looks so good in your back test is because it doesn't it disappears when it doesn't work, but like you might see it flash uh, somewhere in between its cycle of like you know initi initiating the signal and the final like confirmation of it. So like again, like if you have a signal that's based on a five minutes time frame, it could signal on the first minute, the second minute, third minute, and fourth minute, and even the fourth minute and fifty seconds. But in but if it, the second before the signal invalidates, the signal will no longer be on your chart. So when you go and back test, you're not going to get that information. Now, one advantage you can do is you could actually replay the the trades on, on demand. So you can go second by second and actually really understand like what that looks like. And you have to understand what repainting is in order to be a good um, systematic trader because the result on the final chart is always going to look too beautiful. And you have to recognize what are the flaws of this this uh indicator so you know it's always things that you kind of recognize it's kind of like paper trading it's like you can paper trade and kind of get a good understanding of what you're going to do but like until you actually trade it and understand like what are the the psychology behind how you're going to execute or the difficulty of what you're doing uh you you'll never really get that full experience so i i'm always very quick to ship a system because first of all like I don't I don't risk like an insane amount. Like I still I risk like one to three percent of my account per trade. And uh I don't care if I pay to find out information because that that couple of mistakes could lead to like a really good strategy in the future. Or just quickly cut off an idea that, that sucks. Like I I I'm more willing to just try things. That's that's my thing. I'll fail a lot. Yeah. So on the topic of backtesting, because I, from what I hear, you're doing this manually, am I right? Manually backtesting. Mm -hmm. So would there be times where your bias might kick in and then end up giving you an inaccurate view of reality? Say, for example, you're doing a backtesting and then this is a losing trade. And then, you know, the human mind sometimes can reason you know, why this is a losing trade. And then, or why you would have taken this trading setup because of blah blah blah, you know, kind of like hindsight bias. So, is this something that you have to deal with? Um, I well, first of all, I always recognize that trading is a probability game. So, good good setups can fail, right? Um, bad setups can work. And so, the main advantage, really, in this trading environment, is the frequency. So, you can get proven correctly very quickly. Um, or incorrectly very quickly. There's not this. Uh, there's not as much hindsight bias compared to, let's say, like a swing strategy that has like very few trades throughout the year, because uh, the sample size is just constantly coming in. And when you're talking like, um, I'm on my seventh or eighth year now, and I've been recording like every single chart of every single day for that entire time, so I can go back literally with eight years of data uh, with the same specific scenario and. Uh, see that it works so these are um i would say it's not as timeless let's say as like uh jesse livermore kind of strategy because it is dependent on uh outside influences like underwriters things like that or institutions but um i would say the like fundamental like logic of my mean reversion strategy would apply basically to any kind of mean reversion it's just i'm just systematizing the reversal and uh, I recognize the probabilities are lower at the beginning, and I understand how to create a high time frame confirmations that have very high win rates. Like you, it's it's actually extremely easy to create a confirmation signal because um, let's say whether you use like a higher time frame moving average, you use uh, like MACD or RSI, whatever. Um, there's always like confluence with other signals. So like if if a if a signal went off like on a very high time frame, there's a very good chance that you've that everyone using whatever they use, stochastics, Ichimoku cloud, whatever you want to call it, uh, that their signals would have also triggered like a bearish signal before that even happened. So the confluence is what makes it um, like very viable in terms of like everyone is seeing the same thing. Or thinking the same way, but uh, 
the harder signals are all are always the ones that are catching like the tops or like the bottoms because those signals require a lot of invalidation they require a lot of fine tuning however they're not even really necessary uh if you come in with a very modest signal that you can literally see very easily like it signals maybe once or twice per trade has a 50 percent win rate and i can get two to one trade off of it uh those stats can make you profitable so there's not really stress it's just more of like i'm very uh perfectionistic so i want to dominate the trade in a sense <laughs> so like it's just more of an ego thing but i could very quickly and easily create like a retirement strategy in the sense of like super modest return very good win rate and uh, low drawdown and uh, it's there's confluence with other strategies so i think it's fine like just i'll give you like an example like a very common uh like swing trading strategy is to use like multiple moving averages and like reclaiming the average and not only reclaiming it but testing it and then pivoting off and just continuing on its merry way right that kind of system is uh it has confluence with so many other systems like whether it, like again if you use any of the things i mentioned and there's more like I, i've probably tested like all of them they all like measure kind of very similar moves so you know i what i tend what i tend to do is i put on like a lot of indicators that i know people care about and i may not necessarily care about and that helps me even more because i know how other people are thinking so i might be able to think like this person is thinking that it's going to be reversal or this person thinks that's going to be that the move is over or this person thinks that uh the move is not over and that there's more momentum to be out of and i'm going to take a loss and so uh, basically just by being really aware of all the ways that people think i think that helps me as well having a lot of different perspectives and then eventually you just uh if you consider all these different people's perspectives, you can build out a pretty robust idea of like meta patterns. Like a meta pattern would be so be like you just have these like let's say I always put like the a couple of daily moving averages on my charts, even though I don't necessarily care about them. And occasionally they they work really well. And so I've just over time recognized like a pattern within what I've just passively been observing and I could use those at different points in time. So that's kind of like uh, the advantage. Like I just feel like I see things that you normally wouldn't see on the chart if you weren't looking for it. Like you, you can, people can say like, oh, uh, let's go like full minimalist, like price action, time and sales level two. But I feel like you will not, you will not see so much of the details of them recognizing and not only just my own system but others like i can see someone else's system and not react to it but like know it's there that's that's kind of the way i think i don't know do you think that or rather under what scenario would you say that your trading strategy might no longer work one day uh I, so i think that it will continue to work i think the main thing is that it's just going to uh not be scalable to a high degree however like even at the base levels of scale it's still more than like you know most people would be happy with so it really depends on the ambition of a trader like a lot of traders um like even kula maggie mentioned that he graduated basically from small caps to large caps because of liquidity and uh, that that's if you're really trying to go for like that you know nine figures level but you can easily do like seven eight figures in small caps and um i am not really complaining about that so for me like i i don't think it's necessarily going to go away i do think it's over marketed and that i've seen strategies die i've seen edges die but i'm constantly like adapting and like learning new strategies as a result and so as long as um as long as that remains i think that i'll still have an edge and i also I I also talk to a lot of uh, traders of all different levels. So I talk to like intermediate traders, et cetera. And what I recognize is like the difference of edge is not necessarily knowledge, but it's just compounded experience and skill. Like what takes someone, let's say a minute to do would take me like five seconds. 
and or like like little gaps in knowledge um and also just kind of uh like the psychology just knowing how people think how people tend to make mistakes like the major fail points and uh cycles and things like that like i've internalized so much of the information that um i think that really is kind of where the edge is in terms of over your peers not like the overall edge of the strategy and so um in this market is very unforgiving if you don't know what you're doing you can blow up your account like i've seen people who have made well over eight figures of trading lose it in one or two days and that is the that's the cutthroat nature of this trading market Um, when those people bleed out it creates opportunities for people like myself who are not like trying to swing for defenses but rather like be consistent and so like i said like you mentioned like you know how when people get squeezed is that your opportunity like no i get squeezed too but like i get squeezed and i don't really care because i know if i'm getting squeezed other people are getting squeezed and if and most people tend not to manage risk very well so if that's the case then you know unfortunately they just create opportunities for me to trade and that that cycle just repeats on and on and on and the main way that you kind of avoid that is like position sizing very modestly being aware of your risk of ruin like understanding your drawdowns and your strategy so that you don't get too emotional focusing on performance not outcome wiring out capital from your trading account so that you remove um, even more risk of ruin off the table so for example like a lot of traders leave all of their net worth into their trading accounts whereas like i have wired out like over 90 percent of my net profits over the last eight years and therefore, like even if my entire trading account blows up several times, I'm still in the game. However, like I even do not want my trading account to blow up, so I'm very uh, risk averse on the account as, as well. So, um, these are the things that I do to shield myself from those uh, market cycles. Whereas, like a lot of people, they really want to grow their account very heavily, commit all of the resources to it, and uh, you know, it's like if you're risking 30k and you lose 30k that's not like the worst thing but if you grow your account to 500k and you lose 500k like you can still do serious damage i mean like your problems only scale with your account size and you can always lose significant money no matter how much you grow it so uh, being able to kind of reduce that um, opportunity for the market to take from you is kind of a key and i use systems to like wire out money in a way that's logical not like hey i'm just going to take a paycheck every friday or whatever like i don't do that um, i take money out when i have outlier victories out- outlier wins and that's just a rule that i have that allows me to like keep the money i make because in trading it's really just like can- how much can you keep it's not really about how much you can make because it's, r- it's actually rather easy to make money because a lot of times it's just really a coin flip and if you have the risk reward on your side then you know that you only have to win a certain amount of the time, certain percentage of the time, which is very low. Like three to one, can lo- you can win like thirty percent, you know, kind of win rate, which I've done. So, um, you know, I feel like that is the main advantage. Like people's psychological human nature towards greed, towards uh, desperation, wanting to fulfill their needs in the market financially, emotionally, uh, everything like that. That allows um traders who kind of can develop into more professional mindset to like take advantage of this uh, repeating cycle so because i think uh, overall like just to answer like your main question these companies will always exist they, they have always existed uh it's this has been a thing for many many years um if a company is facing like a delisting they will do anything they can to stay on the market because it's literally infinite money i i I wish I could start a company because I know exactly how to manipulate the crap out of it. And <laughs> you you can literally just make exactly infinite money. I mean, uh, as long as you put the paperwork down, it, you have every incentive to stay on the market no matter what. It, it's the best thing you can do. Um, so I know that these companies will always exist. And if they don't, then... I'm not that concerned because one of the things about traders, it's not like a, 
it is not linear. Like you can, there are traders who did super well in COVID and can just re retire. Like it can only take one or two years of really huge gains or whatever, or just a, a, maybe three or five years, let's say something modest, 10 years that you could retire. Like it, you don't, you only need your strategy to work for that long. You know, I've, I've thought about retiring like many times and, uh, and I felt like I could very easily. So it's kind of like, don't focus on that. Focus on like, is the edge exist? Can I exploit it? Does it make sense uh, in terms of that it's not a gimmick? So for example, like when Bitcoin came around like back in the day, I was like, can I, will I trade uh, stocks or on the equities or will I trade Bitcoin? And I was like, I don't have confidence in Bitcoin at this moment in time that it'll be around. Whereas like the market has been around, you know, forever. And it's tied to our society. So it's kind of like, I'm going to go with the safe path, even though I see Bitcoin going insane, because I know it's far less gimmicky in my mind. And uh, yeah, you just kind of have to like make sure that your edge is like not really dependent on some kind of like very niche factor, but rather something that's kind of been there. And uh, yeah, I, th I feel like that that's how this uh, niche exists. Okay. And I've been meaning to ask you earlier, right? So... You trade the small cap stock. So how do you, you know, find potential trading setups on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so you just you basically just scan for stocks that are moving with like significant volume. So stocks that are gapping up or stocks that have made significant moves like over the past couple of days, for example. So like there are so many stocks that are just making huge moves every time. And it's because of the price. You know, it's it's so easy for them to make large percentage moves. And those moves attract lots of different types of traders. You know, even even large cap traders may occasionally see that this stock is, uh, you know, running like 500% or something like that and maybe get interested in it. And so it, it attracts a lot of different people to this market. Um, that's why I like mean reversion on the short side because it's it kind of comes to you. And um, typically on those days, there's a lot of volume. So um, again, like you scan for stocks that are gapping pretty large percentage it's up to you 20 to 20 30 40 50 percent whatever you feel like have a minimum volume criteria because we do need volume to trade obviously and the gaps basically have an implied range so it's kind of like you you have everything a day trader needs you have volume range and uh, ideally volume is also liquidity as well so when you have all three of those things there's a, there's opportunities whether you scalp it whether you trend trade it, mean revert it, even long it. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities to long these things too. And I I want to learn how to do that. But um yeah, you know, the it's super easy. Like they they just kind of just come to you. You just fall on your lap. So the scans are done uh pre market, I suppose? Yeah you can so you can scan any time between pre market. Uh, some people do it like the day before, but I typically scan through pre market and a little bit into market open. Uh, some people scan like all day long, which is definitely viable, but I just don't like uh, constantly being on edge. And I found that there's like less opportunity for me personally. So yeah, I scan pre-market. Uh, usually there's like a lot of different stocks up and you kind of just do your due diligence on them. It gives you enough time to like build a case basically, see if there's edge, grade the stock, and then figure out if you want to trade it. And um, that's basically the process. You just repeat that over and over again. Okay, so you you, you scan the stocks based on gap, a uh, huge price run up, uh, enough range. Then you have a, you probably shortlist a list of candidates based on the how the charts look like, I suppose, right? And from then within the day, you focus on maybe the top five or top ten charts that you have. You know, kind of like create the watch list for yourself for the day. Something along those lines. I'll trade. I'll trade anything. Like if there were times in COVID, I trade like twelve stocks same time, thirteen stocks. Someday, uh, on average, like it's not really like that anymore. The volume or the amount of uh, craziness died down, so it's like more like anywhere between one and four on average. Uh, usually, you'll get maybe like eight to or anywhere between four and eight to ten kind of pings per day on average, and you have to kind of sort through that and find like the best one or two. But um, you know, sometimes there are legitimately like that many opportunities to trade, so. I, I'm not going to say like I'm only going to limit it down to whatever. Like as long as I have buying power, I'll, I'll, I'll trade the stock. Like, a lot of times I run out of buying power just because there's there's too much trade. 
And also this brings me to earlier when we talk about scalability, I think you said seven, eight figures is still doable for this strategy, but nine figures, I think clearly liquidity is an issue. So I'm yeah. thinking out loud over here. So let's say someone has a, a million dollar account, you risk 1% on each trade is $10,000. So if you were to short a small cap stocks, $10,000 worth of small cap stocks, is it still pretty easy to enter in and out of your trades with you know with that kind of size? So in, in COVID, you could go like very large. You can probably go like 100,000. Um, but as of late, the volume has definitely dried up. I would say 10,000 is like kind of on the, like pretty much on the high end where you're start experiencing like some slippage. Uh, dependent upon your strategy. Like if you're, if you are having like a wider risk and stuff like that, obviously you can risk a lot. Like, you know, you can risk, you can risk 50K if your risk is far away, right? Uh, but if you're like being aggressive about like adding into positions and stuff like that, and you're also trying to take advantage of like big moves, then you definitely want to fall within like the, I would say you don't really want to go above 15 to 20 right now. Um, and that's just a, the, the nature of the market at this moment. But like, it can get a lot better, I'm sure. And especially since the overall market, like the macro environment is like, a lot of things are doing well. A lot of assets are doing well, including like Bitcoin and things like that. And typically when traders are more confident or people are more like, up on their investments they are usually more loose and uh, there's more liquidity in general the the massive drop off really was incited by the fact that like the bubble kind of burst at the time like after 2021 and a lot of fear and uncertainty happened with the war in ukraine and interest rates and things like this and uh, a lot of investors and traders really just didn't have a liquidity anymore so less traders less liquidity more happy people more liquidity so i anticipate it can go up um and that is just to say within like a day trading sphere it's not like it's not like there aren't opportunities that have inf like not infinite scale but like very large scale like every once in a while there will be opportunities where you can pretty much go into your heart's content um and those in my mind would basically be like the um a plus trades that uh larger traders would basically wait around for so you the larger account size you have there will be opportunities for you in the niche. You just have to wait longer for the next one. So mm -hmm. uh, I was basically just saying like 10K is kind of on the high end for like on average, if you're coming like day to day and like really want to push the risk. But, um, you know, everyone has different risk management styles. I know people who like don't have stop losses and stuff like that. Uh, so for the risk conscious person that you're going to have some slippage and stuff like that, um, especially if you're trying to add in and all that. But really depends on your strategy. I, I would say like on average, that's a pretty good number to, to say. Okay. And uh, you know, after hearing a number of podcasts, I know often you talk about the R multiple and I, I don't want to go down that, 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 that path because I think you've beaten that to death. Right? You, you say that over and over again until I think you yourself <laughs> are pretty tired right, of repeating that, right? So uh, I think uh, for those of the listeners who are interested about the R multiple that Brian Lee is so, uh, so passionate about, I think there are other podcasts and resources that you guys can, can check it out. Uh, but for now, right? Maybe I'd like to maybe just go back to a time, right? I think there's this interview you did where you talk about how uh, you went from five k to a million dollars in in your trading account. So maybe could you give an overview of the of that entire process, right? Of growing the small account to seven figures and beyond. Mm -hmm. So I should mention I blew up my account right before that happened. So at oh, that right point, before I... that happened, so the five k started after the account blew up. Yeah, so I so initially I started with thirty thousand, okay, and I grew that to like hundred thousand or so, hundred twenty five, hundred fifty. Uh, I actually forgot the exact number, but basically I blew up like over, around a hundred thousand dollars, and uh, had to restart. Uh, in the United States, you have PDT, which like you have to have an account over twenty five thousand. So uh, when I restarted my account, basically I, had, I started again with thirty thousand, um, and I subtract the twenty five thousand from my usable capital because I consider that a blow up if I go under PDT. Basically, if you go under PDT, you can only trade three times a week, which is like way too little for a day trader. And so uh, I basically started with five thousand uh, dollars. The main reason why I was able to do this at the time was because um, the way that I grew my account initially was very controlled, very stable, and with edge and everything and discipline and all that. I blew up my accounts on account of uh, two trades that 
I literally lost control. And that was a result of just not really having systems in place. And um, it was kind of a slow burn because I was at the tail end of this, I was starting to grow my risk to a point where I no longer accepted the risk or like I was having a harder time executing. And uh, I started having those bad habits, you know, like you add to a loser and uh, eventually like you win and you're like, oh, that works. And then you just keep doing it, right? And it reinforces the bad habit until you know like the tail risk exists. And so the tail risk caught up at that point uh, very quickly, actually. And uh, yeah, I just had, I blew up the count. So I recognized like in that moment when I restarted, I was like, you know, up until that point, I was doing everything right. I did lose control in a way I feel like a lot of traders learn that lesson the hard way because it is like you're you're getting rewarded for bad behavior. And emotionally, psychologically, it's very hard not to repeat the behavior. Um, so what I didn't really recognize at the time was like there are ways that you can protect yourself from that, like like a broker instituted max losses and things like this. Systems that are out of your control that can actually stop you from making those mistakes. And basically, uh, I reasoned that those blowups were a result of not having proper systems in place when I was uh, losing control of my emotions and everything like that. And so having instituted those uh, corrections and trading my same exact process uh, that I had co- a lot of confidence in, I was able to grow that over time. So um, I didn't just like start from that point. I did grow my count already. It's just that I made a couple of big mistakes. So I would say I was kind of like at an intermediate stage at that point already. I knew what I was doing. So it's, it still does take time. And even within that uh, journey, I still made a lot of mistakes where like I thought I was getting the hang of it and uh, get, step out of my lane for a second and then pull back. But the exercise of like starting over is really an exercise in uh, discipline and staying in your lane. And so I... I recognize like i have to just do what i do the best cut out all the noise and that journey was just repeating the same process that got me there the first time but doing it with the utmost discipline and just not paying attention to anyone anything any new strategies or whatever and compounding it compounding is the big part you have to constantly be growing your uh, risk in order to achieve gains like that in my opinion because uh when you reinvest your profits into the next day as your risk, you're able to grow your account like really quickly. I mean, a lot of those equity curve sims use actually compounded value. So if you go on the equity curve sim and you plug in like any kind of equity curve uh, statistic line, you'll see that you can grow your account like quite quickly. And that is actually the reality if you can execute it. So, um, you know, that was kind of always my North Star. I just knew that if I compound my account at this rate, then I will hit my goals. It's just a matter of like not blowing up, not making any major mistakes, and being realistic with yourself. Obviously, you're not going to like do a perfect job of getting there. And so I recognize, like, hey, look, I, I'll get there eventually. I may not get there as quickly as the sim says, but I know like I'll get there. And so uh, that helps you trust your process in the sense of like how many times you lose and. Um, just focusing on trading well because you know that like if for some reason your risk management slips and your statistics start to draw down like that can have a massive in- impact on your ultimate equity curve uh, and so you're just like really focused on you know keeping those stats in line and, and and optimizing them as much as you can without ruining your system and that was just kind of the journey just like constantly growing my capital base and, and and trying to do it in a safe way. Like there's a there's a lot more that goes into it. I detail a lot of that in like my content, my blogs, stuff like that. Um, there's like a methodology for position sizing and make sure you don't grow too quickly, uh, which was my main mistake before and uh, wiring out capital. I wired out, remember I wired out like 90% of my profits. I was wiring out during that entire process, even when I was at 35,000, 40,000. Like I, I didn't really care at the time. That does hurt the compounding, sure. But psychologically, that does give like a huge uh, benefit for the trader because you recognize like you no longer have to live your life based on the P and L. Like you, you, you'll be good if you wire out the money. Now the trading capital is just business capital. You're trading as a business. Whatever happens in this account is just uh, you know, it, it's for the business. It's not for you. So that's the way that I view it, and that really helped a lot with um. 
like transforming my trader trading and getting to the next level. Okay. And I want to be respectful of your time. We are currently at a 2 hour mark. So do you feel like, you know, continuing further or you think, you know, you're pretty much kind of maxed out at this point in time? Let's go. Let's go. I don't care. Let's go. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. So earlier you talked about compounding, right? So I just want to maybe just uh, allow you to expand a little bit more so the, the listeners know, you know, what do you kind of mean by, by compounding the account? Yes. So I, so I typically, uh, at the time, I was risking 1% of my account. And uh, so whatever your account value for that day is, you take 1% of that and that will be your R per trade. And um, obviously, if you have a green PL on that day, then you'll take that to the next day, take a percentage of that new value. And that could be a very like shallow move. It could be like, you know, changing your risk from 50 to $51, not very much. It's, at times, you could have a larger gain and it can go from $50 to $60 or $65, $70, whatever. And basically, like by continuously adjusting your risk per trade, um, and I don't want to make it sound like you're always going up, you will also go down. So if you lose capital, you risk less. Um, it has a self-regulating factor to it where when you're underperforming or the market's not uh, working with your strategy, you're going to be sizing down. And vice versa, when you're performing well and the market's going really great, you're sizing up. And so um, through that process, you basically manage the uh, position sizing conundrum by using this basically an algorithm and now you can just focus on trading like your position sizing is essentially like it's not it may not be perfectly optimal and there are ways to optimize it but like on a base level you have a lot of things taken care of you have risk of ruin taken care of which is number one if you risk one percent of your account you at minimum have 100 times till you blew up and it's actually much more because each time you're sizing down and down and down so if you know, we don't really want to go into those uh, intangible numbers. We just want to put, make it easy to understand. But effectively, like if you're going to be a professional trader, you're not going to lose 100 times in a row. Uh, even if you randomly bought and sold, you probably would have a okay winning rate, right? So uh, with Edge, you should win a lot more than that. So with that understanding, basically, you can start mapping out like, okay, this is my typical um, output, like my average winning trade, my average losing trade, my average win rate and start understanding like how much you should actually draw down per day and start mapping out like how many times can I draw down in a row? Like, can I literally max out five days in a row? Uh, you have to map out basically scenarios that you think are outliers because outlier scenarios happen all the time. Like it, black swans happen all the time. So um, being rec recognizing those failure points and then building that into your system uh, with your position sizing strategy basically enables you to withstand like some pretty adverse market conditions or just terrible performances on your on your end and that also gives you confidence to execute because you understand that each trade basically doesn't um have like such a significant impact on your trading account and trading balance and stuff, stuff like that but you also understand the major implication that if you do it correctly and you compound it, like the upside is much bigger. Specifically, when you pair that with uh, large uh, risk reward ratios, like, you know, af if you're like one to one or two to one, like you're not going to pull ahead too much when you win. But if you're going like three, four, five, six, et cetera, on your winners to your losers, then whenever you win, like your compounded values grow like quite rapidly. And you also gain a lot of uh, like distance between, you know, like let's say you win one time, you now you can lose six times in the future. I'm not saying that you want to, but like without actually taking a loss. And um, you know, for me, like that combination of risk reward compounding and being really cognizant of risk and ruin is what allows me to basically just grow my risk over time. It's extremely motivating because. Um, Typically, traders have issues understanding like progression, but when the um, way you position size is is like growing or diminishing with your results, you understand like, oh yeah, I'm here because I put in this work, or I'm at a lower risk because I drew down and I'm performing like crap. Um, it also eliminates the aspect of sizing up and sizing down. Like I never understood how people are so. Um, like discretionary about sizing because they're like 
today I'm going to risk 100. And then if I make good trades, I'll risk 1,000 tomorrow. Or like, I'll risk 500 tomorrow. But they don't have any idea like the implications of the risk rune on their account. They don't, they haven't naturally built a tolerance to the risk that they were at, nor have they actually experienced the levels of risk in between. So for example, like if you're at a hundred dollars risk and the next day you decide I'm going to risk $500, how do you know that you can execute 200, 300, 400 dollars uh, perfectly? The only way you would know is if you had experienced that like to a pretty significant degree. And so through compounding, I find that you basically experience each level pretty intimately and you build confidence. And I have a process called the freeze method, which is basically if if a risk level becomes like pretty significant for you that you've compounded to, you basically stop increasing your risk until you've executed on that risk enough times through thick and thin, through good markets, bad markets, through drawdowns, wired out. Like you really went through the gamut and you understand psychologically you no longer are affected by this risk in the sense that you accept it in totality. You can put the risk on, perform exactly to your standards, and from that point then move on. And I find that um, I've never had an issue besides like way back in the day when I blew up with sizing up. And I've sized up uh, literally from like $30 of risk when I was down like 3000 over PDT to like $60,000 of risk per trade. Like it's just not um, something I ever worried about. And the scale is really just limited by the market you trade. So I have to be cognizant of scale because of the liquidity. However, like if the market was like COVID or whatever, like like I said, you can go to like $100,000 risk, probably even more. Like I have never been past that level. So um, it's hard to say, but I know like at least, you know, you can go very high amount of risk to the point where you don't even really recognize that money as a real life commodity you think of more like points and um and uh, th the difference is that you completely accept it and you have experienced everything so the difference is if i if i risk sixty thousand dollars and for some reason i'm now risking thirty thousand dollars well i know how to trade thirty thousand dollars perfectly i know how to trade forty thousand dollars perfectly uh, i will have no problems whatsoever trading that but the moment that you, if you ask me, oh, you traded six thousand dollars, why don't you just trade one hundred twenty thousand dollars next time? I'm pretty sure, like, I would, I would uh, fuck the trade up. I would, I would scalp it. I would not cover my target. I would uh, not accept the risk. And that's ultimately one of the behaviors that people blow up on. Like, they they always blow up as a matter of like the time that they cannot accept the risk, and they do one of the deadly sins of like adding to losers, uh, letting this. They just freeze and let the stock just like go against them and hope that pray that it comes back. And um, you know, ultimately, if you can just kind of normalize the risk in your mind and emotions and everything, psychology, then you have no problem with uh, executing. And that's the main important part about trading: is just how consistent can you be? Can you show up, do exactly what you need to do, and not make any mistakes? That's all you have to do. Well said. This kind of reminds me of you know weightlifting in the gym, right? You can't just go out there and just, you know, do a 20 kilo dumbbell bicep curl at the start. You've got to start, you know, from 5 to 6 to 7 to 8 to 9, progressively go, go all the way up and before you deal with the 20 kilos, you know, bicep curl, right? So, so yeah, that, that kind of like, you know, hit my mind as you were, you know, sharing that. So, so yeah, uh, you mentioned about the freeze limit. So, I'm, I'm, am I right to say that right now, you're kind of like a level where your risk per trade is largely determined by the liquidity of the markets. Maybe you feel that you can go like 50k per trade, but like you said earlier, the market currently on the high end is about 10k per trade. So you can't do that 50k because of the current market condition. Yeah, exactly. It's a, I learned that the, kind of the hard way because after 2021, I was like, oh yeah, let's, let's, just, let's just go insane. And then um, the liquidity dropped off a lot. And I, at that time, I was exploring, like pushing the bounds of liquidity, trying to go higher and higher. And uh, I learned the hard way that like, you're gonna get slipped on everything and entries, exits. There's, uh, it didn't even matter if I was trading like, um, like thicker names. Like, if you're trading even like a Peloton or Nike or something like that, you, you can still impact the price in the short term. It's not like you can't. And those slippages add up. Like, even if you start just occasionally taking 1.5 R loss, 2 R loss, or you're you're going to take a 3 R win, but it turns into a 2 R win. Uh, like all of those things it contribute to strategy decay. And so you could have a strategy that if you could execute it with liquidity, it would work. But because of liquidity, you no longer can execute it at the same level and get the same stats, despite having a good performance. And so um, those factors basically contributed to me basically to sizing down, 
to adjust to the market. And uh, in in essence, like right now, I'm just basically biding my time, waiting for a hotter market if it will ever happen. But if not, like you know, it's plenty of risk for me. I don't necessarily feel the pressure to build anymore. I like I got the ego kind of beating the hell out of me from trying to push it when it's not the right time. So I understand like just not the way to go. I'm just kind of grateful that I had the experience um, during COVID where I could kind of like push it and just see what's going on because I learned so much about the dynamics of markets and how literally like one trader can change your trade because like if it's at a resistance point where your stop's at and someone just panics out, uh, if they're big enough size, like <laughs> everyone's going to get taken out or um, situations where I've like, I've been like, Oh, this support level looks really juicy. If I just slammed it right now, I think I could, get everyone to panic and i would push the button sure enough like huge waterfall <laughs> like, like, i'm like i'm like holy crap like i'm actually like influencing the market and uh from that point you can develop new strategies like like people want to say that the trading is um uh you know it's fine like you're just trading against uh, the market and it's very ambiguous amorphous but if you're a bigger trader and you can literally move markets and you can mess with people intentionally it's kind of like you can create strategies where you hit some offer or some bid and get everyone to panic out and then just instantly get out like the liquidity is there they're going to panic into you it's kind of a scalp but like you have the power to do that so um, you can create like a lot of different strategies that in maybe give more edge i just um didn't get to explore that as much as i wanted but it, it was definitely like happening from time to time and i uh learned a lot about just how much influence people can have and how much uh, you can push it responsibly and um realistically i just want to stay with my balance so like one way that i do that is just kind of looking at the overall volume like the the volume peaks and trying not to over represent those volume bars like you don't want to be like 100 200 percent of a volume bar right because at that point um, you're moving the market um, regardless it, even some small traders at this time can feel low liquidity stocks where they can actually push themselves so imagine being you know five six x that amount like it's just not going to work so um yeah my experience has just allowed me to recognize like this is not the time to push it and uh, just kind of uh, trade for the business aspect of it and the performance aspect make sure you're still doing good trade for fun kind of and uh you know just collect uh, whatever kind of income comes at that reduced size. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's still a lot of money. It's not like a, it's not a big deal. It's just really if you have that kind of ambition. So Ole, you mentioned that you could start to move the market and make people, for example, trigger their stops. And from what I hear, it's pretty lucrative. So what's kind of like stopping you from, from doing more of that, that type of a strategy where the mana game? <laughs> <laughs> I hate, I hate scalping. I, I like, I see that as a scalping behavior because, um, Usually after like that much capitulations, uh, the stock will just reverse the other way. So if you feel like, oh, I'm going to trigger these stops and then we'll, the momentum will continue, like a lot of times it's very short lived. And so ultimately you do have to kind of scalp those situations. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't like scalping. I like my average hold time on trades is like hours long. And so, um, I pref much prefer risk reward trades and I don't like being a big force. I, remember the first time like um my broker sent me an email saying like the you're supposed to register as a large trader id with the sec and whatever and you have to file an annual form and like tell them what your brokers are and stuff like that and i was like what the hell is this like they're tracking your account now and or like when one time my broker called me and he said like the ecn i think it was i think it was edgex or maybe it was arco something like that they were asking like who this person is that their broker executing these orders and i was like i was like this, i'm just like way too visible right now and i feel like i don't really understand um like who sees what you know i'm sure that people can see more than uh that i can see like i'm just a retail trader and i don't want i don't want to have a target on my back so i much prefer to be smaller uh in terms of like the overall trading volume so that i can just do what i do with less stress i think the most aggravating thing about size is just slippage like knowing that um 
you're going to be your worst enemy someday when you cover, whether it's a win or a loss, is so frustrating. And it's also very apparent. Like when you, when, when you have larger size and you take multiple levels of a, of the bid or offer, uh, I feel like it's extremely obvious. And whether or not you interact with a trader or a market maker, uh, their incentive is exactly the opposite of what you just did. And if you're, and I much prefer to be like riding the wave. You know, like if I was buying a large cap, I want some larger institution to be there accumulating behind me. I'm just taking a piece of it. I don't want to be the institution that has to execute over like days or weeks or months. Like that to me sounds awful. Because <laughs> what if something random happens? You know, like a price shock or whatever. Um, it's just, it's not fun. Like I, I really don't like it a lot at all. Okay. And are there any other trading strategies that you are looking into since right now the environment kind of like caps? than the size of your trades. Um, there, so there's still opportunities like to grow within the space, whether it's uh, going much broader into swing trading or uh, taking the opposite side on the long side. Uh, the other strategies I'm looking at are um, like more cool and strategy. I feel like that can be easily systematized and kind of coincides a lot with like my main trading philosophy, which is like lower win rate, higher risk reward and holding positions. But more or less what I realized is like it's better to just kind of be the best that we do, in my opinion. Like I feel like unless you really want to be like an amazing, like all star Warren Buffett kind of guy, uh if you're doing really well at what you do, you can have a fantastic life and shift those trading profits into like investments or things of that nature, where it's kind of like uh you know, I don't necessarily think that you need to trade your entire life. Like you just have to make enough money such that your money works for you versus you working for the money. So are there any investments that you have right now where your money is working for you? Mm -hmm. So I, I invest in uh, like I own a couple of ATM machines and they uh, generate like really good passive income over time. And I could depreciate them, which was really nice for taxes. And you do certain other investments like similar to that where like you hire an operator. So you hire a third party operator. They obviously take a percentage of it, but like they do the the labor. Like I don't have to go out and like do that. And so um those are good investments. But I mean like really you can like why not just put a lot of your I don't want to say like investment advice, but like historically you could just put your money in the spy or something like that and it will grow right so it's kind of like you don't necessarily have to beat the market i also invest in a hedge fund uh one of my friends hedge fund that's actually you, you mentioned earlier is that in our pre-conversation is that trade the bus trade buster david mm -hmm. All right. yeah i invest in his hedge fund which is so far is so good i really like it and um i also invest in whole life insurance which is like a alternative strategy that grows every single year, like no matter what, at a certain dividend rate. And they've never missed a payment through like Great Depression or whatever. And the advantage is that you can basically grow your money with that dividend rate that's compounds. And you can take a loan against the cash value to invest in whatever. So if, let's say there's an opportunity, an investment, or uh, like let's say the market crashes and I just feel like I want to dip by this opportunity, you can basically take out like 95% of the cash at a, at a certain interest rate and then invest into the opportunity while it also grows at the exact same rate um, because your cash is still there invested. So you can grow your money in two different places. So it's basically like I have a pretty uh, diversified kind of uh, investment strategy passively. And all of them basically are kind of on the safe side. Like I don't put money into things that are not either generating cash flow or just growing uh, pretty stable. So I'm not, I have no exposure to like uh, cryptos or anything like that. But yeah, most of my money is just in those kinds of investments. You spoke about owning two ATM machines earlier, and that got me curious. How, how does that work? <laughs> oh, not two. I, I own, a, I own a, like a lot. <laughs> oh, so yeah. So what's like the business model behind owning a ATM machines? 
So they they do um, these uh, studies on like where to place them strategically. And I don't think I will invest in the future. Obviously, they, there's kind of, you know, cash is not really going to stay around, I don't think. Uh, but basically, like, they find area, like high traffic areas where communities still use cash. And uh, you just basically take a percentage fee for processing the, you know, transaction. And so that is pretty good income. Like, there's, an, there's another trader who also owns ATM machines. His name is uh, Splendorus. And he uh, was interviewed with inter- uh, investors on the ground as well. I think he actually does that like legitimately himself. Um, I just pay a third party operator. But um, you know, there's like a lot of different things you can do. And honestly, like the only reason why I need to go to these links is largely because I'm from California and the taxes are extremely high. Like at some point, you can have like a fifty percent tax liability. And so, unless you find like really a- smart investment strategies that reduce your taxable income like you're gonna lose so much so like if i lived you know in a non-tax state or something like that then i don't think i would own atm machines like i'd probably put it in different uh investment vehicles any plans to move to other states where it's more tax favorable uh no i the thing is the family's here and um i enjoy california very much like the the food is really great. The nature is really great. Um, and I personally like have traveled all over. Um, specifically, like I've been to Japan. I went to Italy as well. You can find very comparable food here. Like very, very comparable. Uh, if not in some ways, like even better. And I know that's like harsh to say, but like as someone who really enjoys food, uh, there's like a huge amount of amazing food here so i kind of appreciate the quality of life in california a lot got it nice and you know since you have plans investment plans passive income so is day trading something you plan to do you know for the rest of your life or eventually there'll be a cutoff points it's like uh uh-uh, it's enough i'm out of here <laughs> i i haven't I, I i think i've definitely slowed down a lot more in terms of like being willing to take off more time and i can see myself uh potentially automating some strategies in the future Um, i do like i've always built systems in the back of my mind of like if i did retire this is how i would execute and so i know like those can still capture the opportunities i'm looking for um however like they won't capture as much so right now like i feel like i'm still young i'm grinding Uh, i enjoy it i am getting definitely more tired of it though and I definitely feel like I am not going to trade for the rest of my life. So um, until I think I'm just exploiting whatever I can as as I can right now. So I would be I don't have to work traditionally until retirement age. I could retire young. So it's not really a big deal. Perhaps now you can be the one uh, sponsoring the prize money for the international competition. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought so. I, there's another game called Valorant that I really enjoy. Oh, Valorant, yes, yeah, like Counter Strike, but it's more fast paced. If I'm not wrong, yeah, they're. they're their prize pools are so low that I'm like, dude, I could just run my own tournament. I mean, what what is this? And it's like, <laughs> I've thought about, it. I've thought about sponsoring teams, things like that. But um, you know, you, people thought of a lot of things during COVID, and things changed when the money was not as, it's not coming in as it used to. So I'm just like, nah, I'll wait. <laughs> like <it's, laughs> the, those industries do not make money. Uh, esports does not make money. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they are hemorrhaging. Because people don't, investors don't understand the actual product, and uh, it's a lot of mismanagement. You're working with young professionals who expect a lot of money, f- and also the companies are very greedy, so they don't um, they don't reinvest the capital. Valve was pretty good about it because they like increased the price pools based on the sales of uh, in-game products and tr- pass that on to players. However, like uh, it's very top-heavy, so even if you're not the top one percent of one percent you probably will not have a living wage. You'll probably still be in poverty. So um, I think there's a long way to go in terms of esports. But uh, as someone who's competed and looked into the management side of it, like it is just not good. You don't want it, you want to stay far away from uh, esports right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so earlier, just a couple of more questions before we conclude. So earlier you talked about like, you want to take it slow, then to have some like, 
retirement trading system, right? So, so what's an example of a retirement trading system? Yes, higher time frame confirmation signals, higher win rates, so less drawdowns. Um, would not be compounding the risk, so I would keep it as stable risk, and basically just have it execute on uh, the most ideal setup. So basically, like setups that. So right now, like you, you can still trade mean aversion a lot of ways. So there's two different ways I would say is like one is called a ideal trade location. Basically, if the stock is having fresh parabolic moves, uh, virtually the entries that you get will have good risk reward and um, more risk. But you can still take the trades as what I call continuation, which is like if the trend is obviously like if the trade is obviously broken and reversing it's created structure already and you're basically just joining trend to capture like a smaller portion of that meat of the bone um if you capture that portion of the meat of the bone or meat of the move then uh it can be pretty consistent because uh the trade is already broken it's just that you're not going to have as good of reward so like I would say that, um, like a lot of these uh, retirement strategies would be more on the continuation side, and uh, just not as optimized, but pretty easy to manage. Like you just, the trade's already like shown its cards. It's kind of like coming into poker where you've already seen like four cards on the table or three cards, and you're like, okay, my hand's pretty good. Like let's go, you know, place the bet, and uh, the risk reward's fine, two to one. 50 percent 60 percent seven percent something like that so okay so it's just pretty much still the same trading principles but you're doing it on the uh, on a longer duration basis right where the market has kind of like reversed a little bit already before you enter the trade yeah and then like in terms of all those price target signals stuff like that i would just use the conservative target so it's something that would hit like most of the times and then that way you just uh stop or target that's it I see. And uh, before you go, I just one question for you here is like, what is one piece of advice you would give to your twenty year old self, right? If you you know could see him in front of you today. Oh, my twenty year old self, I would say that uh, <laughs> get into trading ASAP. Or if you do not believe me, because I'm an apparition from the future, if you were going to compete in Dota still. Always stay true to your like to the idea that you need to have a strategy. Do not wing it. Uh, think everything through. Come into each game with a plan that you're confident in that you put in the work. Uh, do not adapt so much to your opponents, but rather play your own game. And um, make sure that you discipline everybody to follow your idea like i don't think that like in hindsight it was not very helpful to basically be influenced by so many people and this also applies to trading it's that a lot of times if you i feel like if you have the mind for like strategy and things like that and i'm not even really like good at strategy in general but like again i just work pretty hard at what i do so as long as you put in the work and you're confident in the work and effort that you put in and you feel like that's reasonable, uh, I feel like you should just hard commit to what you want to do because at the very least, you're taking control of variables that you can't control. And, you know, let your opponents make mistakes. Just be the best at what you do. That's all you need to, that's all you need to do to succeed, I think. Nice. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. I really enjoyed this this conversation with you here today, right? You know, we talk about esports. You give me uh, insights to how competitive gaming is like, you know, something that I have never achieved nowhere near your level of achievement. You explain to me step by step, you know, your trading methodology, right? You know, in a very systematic way, patient. So thank you, right? I really appreciate your time and I'm so happy to be able to speak with you today. Right? Thank you, Brian. Yeah, anytime. Thank you.